Great, I think we are going to go ahead and get starting, started this evening. So welcome everyone to the April 5th meeting of the uh, Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board. This meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the redevelopment board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. I will now uh, confirm that all members of the redevelopment board are present and can hear me by taking a roll call. Ken Lau. Uh, here. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tintakalos. Here, President. Uh, Rachel Zemberry, I'm here, and David Watson will be joining us at eight o'clock. And we have uh, three members of the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development with us. I believe we have uh, Jenny Rait. Here. Erin uh, Zwerko. Here. And Kelly Linema. Here. Thanks. Okay, uh, before we move into the first item on our agenda, which is uh, docket number 3650, I will just um, like to let everybody know that we will be um, cutting off all uh, public comment and discussion on this docket number by 755 uh, so that the board can decide with the applicant on the next steps so that we are ready to begin the zoning uh, warrant, the continued uh, public hearings for the zoning warrant, warrant, warrant articles for 2021 town meeting right at eight o'clock as posted. So I just wanna make sure that there is no confusion on that. If there is anyone waiting in the queue, we will uh, ask at that time that you uh, please submit any comments that you would like to, um, to, to bring forward uh, via, via written communication or at the end of the meeting uh, at open forum. And with that, uh, we will go ahead and open docket number 3650, which is uh, 190 and 192 to 200 Mass Avenue. And uh, do we have the applicant, I believe, Attorney Anessi, I saw you in the participants list. Yes, I am here. Fantastic. Will you be doing the presentation this evening or will somebody else from your team? I will team? be making the initial opening statement. And I have a team here who will be discussing the plans themselves. Fantastic. And if you could, um, I, I know that there's a, a complex um, uh, uh, site development that you're going to be speaking to. Um, you know, we, we all have the, the, the plans. If you could uh, keep this to five minutes to the highlights, I'm sure that a lot of the nuance will be discussed in the, in the, uh, the detailed questions that we'll be asking you. I am going to be brief, Rachel. Thank you so much. What I am going to do is just indicate that the petitioner is once again the Pascuto family. They, uh, they're Arlington, of course, uh, through and through. They did the development at 82 Mass Ave. They, uh, they are doing the development at 402 Mass Ave as well. And I need to say this, uh, that I have had discussions with the family about the possibility of going 40B with respect to the site. And the reason I've had those discussions is when I looked at what we're proposing and I see that uh, we are going to have 37 units and 21% uh, of those units uh, are in fact uh, uh, going to be affordable. That is eight, okay. And that we could do 40B if we went 20 to 25%. And of course, at that point, not be subject to uh, some of the rigorous standards we'd have to meet with respect to zoning, because uh, we could ask for waivers. Uh, I've discussed that with the clients, but nevertheless, we are going ahead with this mixed use proposal at this point. The team I have with me 
will be uh, the project manager, uh, John Murphy. He will be introducing each of the uh, individuals who are talking to the plans. Uh, I think uh, you, if you've looked at the plans, you know essentially what we are proposing. We want to stay with the ARB. We do not want this matter to go to the zoning board uh, uh, under 40B. Uh, and we'd like to work with the members of the ARB to come up with a plan that makes sense not only for the town, but also makes sense for the developer who's spending money to develop the project. With that, I told you I'd be brief. With that, I'm going <laughs> Turn it over to John Murphy uh, and let John Murphy introduce the members of the team and we can discuss the plans. John? Thank you, Bob, and good evening, everyone. I will be brief. I just have a couple of highlights and then I'll turn it over to uh, Aaron Mackey from Allen Major to briefly talk about the site. Turn it over to Peter Slowick from Market Square Architects. He can answer some questions about the overall floor plan and then we'll, we will turn it back over to you all. Um, so a couple of things, we tried to go above and beyond to give you all a very complete package so we can have a very um, in-depth discussion, answer all questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, we wanted to be known that what we are trying to accomplish here is to improve. So I know sometimes that can get lost. Everyone has a different idea of what that means. But what we've come back with at this point is a five-story five story building, 37 total units, mixed up of ones, two bedrooms, and studios, Bob mentioned uh, we have eight affordable units, which is more than the 15% after logging into many meetings over the last year. We do know that um, new constructed affordable units is very important. We took that into account. Um, one thing to vary that is very important to note, this building as proposed here is not moving. It is essentially the same footprint, same foundation. It's actually shrinking in the rear in order to add some shrubbery. Uh, you know, one of the challenges of this building and the site from a development standpoint is what you see is essentially the property line. We're surrounded by three streets with a little alleyway and a building behind us. And because of that, it can become difficult to hit every single ratio guideline, setback, you know, you name it. Um, the less area you have to work with, the harder that becomes. So what we have is on the first story, we have parking in the rear about 15 spaces, the whole front part along Mass Ave is designated commercial space. I know that it is less than what was there uh, before. I'm happy to talk about that later when it, I'm sure it will come up, but we can move on from now. But the important thing to note is it is the entire frontage of Mass Ave. And you can talk, you know, we walk through, we walk tenants through spaces all the time and we can talk about this if you would like. Tenants want the frontage on the streets. They don't like very deep spaces because it's the same type of human nature you have even in your home. The more space you have that you're just working with, the more you'll spread out even if you don't need it. The difference is, you know, this is a business expense for a tenant and they have to pay for that square footage. So happy to get more into that if you would like. Um, the front of the facade of that commercial space is brick. I know a lot of has been talked about brick in the past that people like it. It's a good look. It does kind of carry, I think, the general look of the area. Uh, we like how it looks. It's a little more difficult to make happen, but you know, we think we can do it. Um, at this building, we do have our step back on the upper stories, which we actually genuinely think is a great amenity for the tenants. And, and we also believe it accomplishes what the goal of creating that setback in the first place was. Um, and lastly, we do have the 15 spaces. We know that that's not technically what the um, required spaces would be. However, we do, have our, we do have our electric vehicle charging station. We have all of our long and short-term bicycle required parking. And I will say too, that we are pursuing a Zipcar partnership, which is something we've seen used very successfully in other places meaning not just people from the building would be able to make use of it, but people from the general you know, community right there in the area, if you're approved through Zipcar and you need a car for a little bit and that's there and it's available, you'd be able to uh, use it as well. Um, with that said, I'd like to pull Aaron Mackey on to kind of keep the train rolling and he will make some notable site comments and, and walk through the table with you. Thank you, John. Yeah, uh, Jenny, if I could just start at the existing conditions plan, that would be great. Just to give a quick summary of the existing site. Um, 
Yeah, one more. Yep, that sheet. Um, so yes, my name is Aaron Mackey. I'm with Allen & Major Associates uh, with the civil engineers on this project. Um, as you can see here, the existing conditions plan, the site's bounded by frontage on three sides uh, with Main Street, Lake Street, and Chandler Street. Uh, the site's approximately 11,134 square feet, 0.26 acres. Um, there's, the existing building is approximately 9,915 square feet. In the existing building, the site is all, pretty much all building, and the remainder of the site is paved. Uh, this is zone B3, village business, and the western pro along the western property line along the alley there, um, that line is the R5 apartment district is right on the other side of that line. So we're uh, abutting that in the back. Um, the sites, existing sites served by, serviced by municipal water, sewer, gas, tele, electric, it's all available. And there is an existing curb cut along Chandler Street that we are proposing to maintain in the proposed condition. Uh, you could just scroll to the layout sheet now, Jenny. Sheet 102, yep, that's perfect. So the proposed building is approximately 9,764 square feet. It's slightly reduced. Um, you can see we took out the, the odd jogs and we have set it back as John had mentioned in, in, uh, along the alley there. Um, and that was to maintain a 7.5 foot wide buffer with Abravati plantings and five foot screen fence. Because um, this is uh, a requirement of section 5.3.21 um, to, it's actually a 15 foot buffer, but we can, it can be reduced to 7.5 if, if we do provide those plantings in a fence. So that was the goal to achieve with, with, with that property line and that, and abutting the R5 district. Um, uh, so at, it, it, the table up there, we could walk through that a little bit in the top, right. It's going to be tough to see, but I could just speak to a couple points. Um, so Parking, so that's the parking table there. Um, we are proposing 15 stalls where 45 is required. John had touched on that. This is the bicycle parking table. Um, we are gonna be in compliance with the bicycle parking bylaw um, where short-term stalls are proposed along uh, next to the entrance to the garage and in, in the interior of the building, which Peter could touch on, we have provided some long-term, 60 long-term bicycle parking spaces. Um, and these spaces were again, provided to be in compliance with the bicycle parking guidelines. And, and if you just keep scrolling to the right there, plan right, we could just take a quick peek at the zoning table that we're providing. Here's the zoning summary table. So of course the lot area is re remaining unchanged. Um, minimum lot area per unit, uh, it's not a requirement, but we it's going to be 301 approximately square feet. Uh, minimum frontage unchanged. It's going to remain at 102 uh, along Main Street. Minimum front yard setback. Um, it is zero feet, and we're going to keep it zero feet because we are keeping a portion of the existing structure there that's right on the property line. Uh, the minimum side yard is zero feet, um, and we are going to provide 7.5 feet as noted along the alleyway there. Um, we've factored that the rear yard's not required. Um, the screening buffer, as I touched on previously, 7.5 feet, we're gonna propose. Uh, the landscaped open space, um, there is 0.9 existing and we're gonna increase that to 4.8 with the plantings in the rear. Um, and the usable open space will be improved with the installation of a uh, roof deck amenity. Um, and with that, um, we could take a look at the drainage plan. So you're actually at double the um, amount of time that you were allotted already. So okay. if you could wrap up, um, I'm sure that we'll have have questions going forward. Um, Perfect. That's that sounds good. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I would just say, yeah, the drainage where we're increasing the impervious, uh, I mean the impervious area, so we'll be in compliance with uh, the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, with that, I think that's enough for, for me. I'll kick it over to Peter, who can just touch on the uh, the building. And I, I'd ask that you please, please be brief. Like I said, you're at double the amount of time that we had allotted for the presentation. Okay. All right, thank you, Rachel. I'll go through it very quick. Uh, Jenny, if you could just flip to our sheet 9.01, something for me to talk over. 
Um, so just to reiter reiterate real quick, we're proposing five stories, four stories of residential, one story of commercial. A um, few key features on this proposal, we exaggerated the third story step back requirement, which is only seven and a half feet, uh, uh, to make it a usable roof amenity. We preserve the aesthetic of the old savings bank on the corner of Mass Ave and Chandler. We provide uh, copious uh, centralized bike storage for the tenants. And we provided the entirety of Mass Ave frontage uh, at grade to a commercial use. So you'll see at the end of this set, um, we explored the context a bit through street elevations, which you're looking at now. Uh, particularly the Mass Ave elevation. And what we're going for here is to look at the relationship in uh, massing proportions and fenestration pattern and how that harmonized with the very important Capitol Theater. And later on in the set, we provided solar studies, which were conducted to demonstrate the relatively minimal impact to the surrounding residential zones. So I'll turn that uh, back over to John if he has any further comments. All set. Thank you, Rachel. Thank Great. you, Peter. Thank you very much. So with that, I will um, actually turn this over to uh, the, the department to go through any points that they would like to highlight from the um, memo that was put together. So Jenny, I don't know if that will be you or uh, Aaron or Kelly speaking. I'm going to see if Aaron would like to speak to the points that we've raised in the memo. Um, I, uh, this is Aaron Zorko, Assistant Director. Um, I don't have um, much more to state than what has already been stated. Um, this uh, is a mixed use building. We are um, interested about the additional affordable units um, because they are offering um, more than what is required by Section 8.2 of the Zoning Bylaw. Um, and the ARB may um, consider that in their deliberations on this project. Um, but with that, I won't take any more time um, from the discussion and public comment um, in this meeting. Great, thank you, Erin. And thank you to the applicants for the, the thorough materials and the presentation this evening. Um, I think you set us up for a, for a very uh, good discussion. So again, thank you. So we will start with uh, Ken for any questions or comments for the applicants. Uh, yeah, let me start off with uh, a couple of comments to start off with first. Um, I, I would wish, wish you would um, include some more documentation on the third floor um, terrace. You're saying that is um, outdoor amenities for the people living there well i like to see what you want to do there right now you're showing a roof plan but it'd be great if you would show um is there a walkway there is there any vegetation is there a fire pit is there grilling areas uh, all stuff that you know you, you would you you're, you're saying you're doing but let's show it so we understand what you're doing there that'd be very important to us um my second point is if you can look at the, can you get to the garage, Jenny, uh, with the parking stalls? I think it was, the civil drawing showed the best because uh, it shows the stalls and so forth. Essentially, you have two, uh, keep on going, Jenny. Uh, 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 essentially, you have two stairs coming down to the ground floor. One stair empties into the lobby and the other stair empties into the garage. The stair emptying into the lobby can be done. Uh, but the, the stair that empties into the garage, you have a walkway path that goes across the parking lot. Then you have a rear door there. And then, then you exit out through the alleyway out to the street. I don't think you can do that by code. Um, you're going from one, ha uh, one less hazard system to a more hazard system. I would like you to uh, confirm that with uh, the building department and uh, verify that, um, that you can do what you're showing, but I don't think so. Um, so if that's the case, then you, you would um, probably lose 
um, that walkway along the back there, you may be able to gain a parking space, another miniature parking space, and you might lose a space up front. So you have more of a direct walkway out into the sidewalk. Um, and it may, it may uh, make uh, um, the commercial space uh, a little deeper, uh, just so we're not in a corner there, so, so it's not so tight. And it, it will probably um, activate this, um, this, you know, that sidewalk a little bit more because it seems a little barren to me right now. Uh, that's that one area there. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is you're saying this could potentially be uh, retail or restaurant. Um, I would like you to incorporate um, duct work from the lower floor all the way up to the roof showing that you have allocated space for a restaurant, uh, namely the restaurant exhaust. So it can be done if, if, you, if a restaurant was to go in there. I don't want to say later on, oh, we have too many units above, we, we have to rearrange everything. Let's, let's incorporate uh, that in, I think it can be done now easily. Uh, that's another one uh, I want you guys to address. And uh, lastly, uh, along, I believe it's, uh, uh, Chancellor Street side, you have all your um, stairs and elevators um, aligned on the outside wall there. And that pretty much makes a dead elevation. Uh, I, I really like you to look at uh, moving those um, amenities inboard a little bit more and have more windows. Because right now, you, I don't believe your windows are coordinated with your floor plans. If you if you look at the lobby and look at uh, where you have the mail room and in the lobby, it's not coordinated with the outside windows. You got these big, huge, uh, archy windows there, and they're not coordinated. It, 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 uh, that space should be moved to the side or the other side of the lobby, so you can have uh, those grand windows that give you more light. That's that's more you no, know, that's more advantageous to you guys. And then if you look at the upper floor plans, I think if you move these structures inboard, you may get a studio unit, may become a one bedroom, which adds more value to the project. So I, I, I would advise you to do that. Uh, and in turn, it would bring more life to that side of the, of the elevation. So the windows are no longer blank or looking into a stairwell. They're actually looking into a bedroom. And that's, I think that's advantage. And you can, you probably have to lose a little bit of your storage space, but you gain a bedroom. I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a good trade-off. Um, I think that's, that's, I think that's enough for now. Um, I'll let my other uh, board members pick up some other stuff, but that's, that's essentially what I, I've got so far. Great. Thank you, Ken. Did you want them to respond to any of those, those questions or just note those for points right now? Um, if they want to respond, they can, but I don't, I don't think so in, in the, and the fact that we don't have that much time, I think they, they can address those. I think these are two items that we probably want to discuss internally uh, ourselves, Rachel, as well. John, would you agree with that? Yeah, just real quick, third floor terrace, we can show all that. That's not a big deal. We can deal with the code staircases, look at the parking, show the duck roof for restaurant, we can do that. Um, for the moving some of the elevator and that type of stuff, we need to look at more. Um, but the other things are uh, easily done. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Jean, we'll go to you next. Thank you. As long as we're on this page, does the elevator come down to the basement to the level where the parking lot is? So if someone needed to use an elevator to get to the parking lot, how would they have to do that? Yes, it comes right down. Um, trying to, it's to the left of the staircase. That little box right there. It's a two-sided elevator, Gene. Yeah, that's correct. Right there. Oh, I see. I see. So they, from the rear side, there's a way out into the parking area. Okay, thanks. And where is the entrance for the residents into the building? Nope, it's um, right where you just were, that elevator or there's the um, 
right to the, yep, that's an entrance right there from outside. You have the elevator and another door across from her cursor. So the entrance on the front that faces Mass Ave is for the commercial space only? Yes, two, there'd be two entrances, the, and we would look at you know, actually reusing the same bank door that we have to recreate that entrance, both the, the retail, commercial, restaurant, whatever it would be, it'd have two, at least two entrances there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciated that you're, you're saving the facade from the bank building. I think, I think that's a, a nice touch. You know, one of the things that the staff mentioned in their very nice and well put out memo is the net loss of about 9,300 square feet of commercial space. Can you talk a little bit about um, whether or how you could increase the amount of commercial space that's available here? Sure. Well, you know, I don't think without, I mean, if theoretically you could take away parking spaces, which we think we want, we would really like to have some for our tenants as we only have 15. But, you know, just you're just adding space into the rear of your space. I'm not really sure. You know, one thing to keep in mind is this isn't a destination like a stop and shop plaza. You know, retail a restaurants a very good example because it can, it has a different type of audience with it's a very strong destination people will walk there but the type of retail that you in commercial you need here really is not necessarily destination specific like a like a t-mobile or at&t store like a cvs like um, something along those lines where you might find in a shopping plaza it really is probably a restaurant will probably be here that's really what we envision because we think it's a very good size for a restaurant they take the whole space it would be a. It would be good for them to be below the units. It would be a good staple in the community. We don't really view this building as three chopped up different commercial spaces that are long and deep. And yeah. that's just our opinion on what we've seen as leasing or not leasing. But I just don't know if adding in the rear and taking away parking really actually gains anything from a. You know that tenants would say, "Oh, that's amazing. We want a deeper space and less frontage on Mass Ave." By the way, I have spoken with counsel for the existing restaurant owner, and that owner is willing to consider coming back to the property once we build out that commercial space. And presumably, we may well build that out for restaurant space. Yeah, keep in mind, this building only has two active, it's essentially, you know, two active tenants in it. One, we already have, we think, a home for. Um, hopefully down at 882 Mass Ave and the other one, I'm not sure is completely operating at the moment, but we'd like to work with them to make this their new home when the building is built. And other spaces are empty and, and need a lot of work. Did you give any, thank you, that's helpful to understand. I have a little trouble and I'm interested in, in the other members of the board on this. I have a little trouble with how the building looks above the first floor. Um, and it also doesn't seem to blend in well with the other buildings in the immediate neighborhood of Capitol Square in terms of the look. And I just wondered if you gave any consideration to have it being a brick building the entire way up. I noticed that in Cambridge, especially some of the uh, mixed use buildings that are getting built in North Cambridge along Mass Ave, they seem to be all brick faced, at least on the front. And I wondered if you'd given any consideration to doing that so it would um, be a better neighbor to its neighbors. I mean, to be honest, we, we did look at it. Um, and I'll let Peter, if Peter wants to, I feel free to jump in, Peter. But I think we did want to separate a little bit the, you know, restaurant space from the rest of the building. Not only that, you know, I'm sure I think I've heard it discussed before um, in, in the meeting. Masons are a rare trade these days. It is extremely, extremely expensive. So mm -hmm. it is hard to do. It. I'm just going to be honest. When you're talking about a podium parking building and a five, you know, multiple stories in, in brick, it is 
very, very expensive. I'm not saying that's an excuse, but I will say we looked at it and we thought that it made more sense to go with, you know, one story as brick for yeah. now. Maybe Rachel or, or Kim can help, but I've seen some of the new buildings. They seem to have pre, pre-made panels somewhere else that are then just um, hoisted into place. So it's not like you had brick masons on the site, um, you know, building up three or four stories. But when the building is done, it looks like it's faced with, with brick. So, you know, um, I guess, Bob, you know, Ken and Rachel deal a lot more than I do with this. So I don't deal with it very much at all in building buildings. So I'd be interested in hearing what they have to say about that. I wonder, this might be for Bob. Bob, it's not close to the floor area ratio. What's your explanation about why we should allow something that's so much greater than the what's allowed by the zoning bylaw. Well, it is mixed use. We know that, okay. And I think the planning memo makes a very interesting point. The planning memo indicates that in a B3 zone, you can go five stories, okay? You can go up to 60 feet. That's totally not compatible with what you would be allowed to do in the, with the property in that B3 zone uh, with respect to uh, complying with the FAR. So I think we're faced with a situation here. Yes, we are seeking uh, for an expanded interpretation of the FAR. I've explained before, particularly in the 8A2 development, that in my view, the ARB has the authority to do that. Uh, and again, this is a consideration for my client. Uh, if my client went 40B on this project and went before the zoning board, uh, and of course, at that point, the ARB would lose jurisdiction, went before the zoning board, we'd be seeking waivers. And we would not necessarily have to comply with the rigors of the black letter law in the zoning bylaw. But uh, in fact, we could seek waivers. And under 40B, it's likely uh, if we weren't being greedy about it, we could get them. So I'm suggesting to the members of the uh, ARB that this is an opportunity for you folks to be able to work with us to come up with a project that makes sense, okay? And yes, I'm asking you to exercise expanded authority, uh, which I think, again, you have under environmental design use and mixed use. And, and Bob, I would just add that that's one of the reasons why from the get-go, we jumped out with more affordable units than we know that we, than is required because we know we need relief on a few of these things and we know this is a collaboration. And so that's one of the things we wanted to offer from, from the start. Now, we're not coming to this project with empty hands, Gene. We're coming to the project with offering an, a number of things, offering two extra affordable units. So keeping it before the ARB, okay? So before, well, I, uh, Bob, I'm sorry to cut you off, but before we go any further, I just wanna be um, mindful of the time. It's now 7.35, but I do wanna be able to get to public up. comment. Let's so Jean, if I could ask that if you could just maybe run through the points that you would like to make. Um, I, I certainly expect this to, to come to another hearing and I'd like all of the board members to be able to make their points. Um, sure. Yeah, I, yeah, just a few things, I think, when they come back, it would be very helpful for them to respond to the various comments in the staff memo. Some of them had to do about traffic and some of them had to do about site circulation, things like that. Um, I'm interested, as I said, about the brick facing on front. Um, the, the, the step back in front is very nice. The, the zoning bylaw requires a step back on each street frontage, and this doesn't show one on Lake or Chandler. So I think it's worth thinking about um, how you might accomplish that also. And um, let me think if there was anything else. Um, no, I think, I think I'll, 
I think I'll stop there for the moment. As a side note, we do have our track at traffic consultant on the line to answer those questions. If you did have those questions and the board wanted those answered, now we're prepared to do that. Yeah, I, I think next time, because as Rachel said, there's not much time. The other thing is 37 units and 15 parking spaces. When you come back next time, it would be really helpful for you to have us understand how those 15 spaces are going to be allocated among 37 units. Good point, Jean, we'll do that. Okay, that's it for now. Great, thank you, Jean. Melissa? Thank you, so I'm the new um, ARB member and I'm not as familiar with you. So if you don't mind to introduce yourself, which one's the owner and the architect and if you could just help me out just introduction wise. Uh, the owner has not spoken. I'm the attorney, Robin. Okay. Thank you, Bob. The project manager is John Murphy. John Murphy, okay. Are you working for um, the Market Square? Are you the, one of the architects, John Murphy, or just? That, that I, work for, I work for Summit Real Estate Strategies and we were hired by the Prosciutto family. We work directly for them. Okay, and have you worked with them on the other projects? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what's their motivation for redeveloping this site? Uh, the motivation is that um, if you've been in, in and around the building ever, I mean, it needs many, many upgrades. Uh -huh. um, everything from electrical to some structural to H, you know, HVAC, all mechanical systems. And it's getting very close to vacant as it is right now. Um, we think with one tenant essentially left that we'd like to recreate a home for. So at this current state, given everything that's happened in the last mm -hmm. year, we think it's a good opportunity to, to redevelop the site. Now, when you do that, you really have to, at the end of the day, convince the bank that you have a good project to get the funds to do it. And so our motivation is to take this time to bring back something better. So hopefully when we get out of this entire pandemic, we also have a new and improved site Great. as well. Who's the tenant that's there? Uh, right now, I have Little Q, Hot Pot, and uh, Mass Holes. Okay, and the, oh, right, on the other side. And both of them, mm -hmm. you said only one of them will be rehoused, and you're really locating one. I'm just curious who those guys are. Yes, um, Little Q is the one that we would like to bring back in the space if, if they would like to, and Mass Holes has a, uh, a different opportunity we're looking at with them. Okay. Um, see here. Well, in terms of some of the, you know, kind of the density in FAR, I'm comfortable with the um, mixed use component, I think I'm comfortable with the idea that you're bringing some affordable housing from the get go. That's, you know, from the short time, even on the board hearing a lot of the town meeting articles, a lot of people are concerned about how that is um, presented and kind of gets fit into redevelopment projects. Um, I'm think I'm also interested on the parking. I probably lean towards um, less parking myself when it's on an MBTA route like this, the 77 and so close to the bike path. So I'm kind of curious, even with the reduction in the parking, how that 15 is working, is it exclusively for the residential or is it shared with the retail at all? It would be just for the residential and it's, it and it'd probably be something that is like at most other uh, residences, you pay extra for it. Okay. And, first come, first serve type of thing. And there's one spot dedicated for a zip card now. Is that, I remember? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and then I probably need some, in terms of some language also, Rachel, I'll probably be curious in terms of your um, thinking on this. I like keeping that first building, but when I see some of the um, material chosen for the second portion, it does seem, um, it doesn't seem to have like the same gravitas as that kind of first level brick. So in terms of having it relate better to one another, um, I'm not sure it's the fenestration or just kind of the cladding that's kind of proposed at this point, but it, it has a look that I'm, I have to kind of work with. So there is that. Um, and I will stop there at this point and let my other members go forward. Great, thank you, Melissa. So I'm just gonna make a couple of quick um, points in terms of things that, that I 
uh, love for you to take a look at. Jenny, if you could go to, I think it's the next slide, which is the perspective elevation. Um, and I'll just echo what a few of my colleagues have mentioned. I just don't see any relationship at all currently between the first floor commercial space and the facade treatment and the, the upper stories, and that, that needs to be addressed. So whether, as Jean was suggesting, the two-story section above the, um, above the commercial spaces um, goes to masonry and perhaps the rest of the building is a different material, that's one thing you could look at. You could certainly look at um, you know, whether we're, we're banding or we're adding any um, brick um, columnar elements or perhaps a different, more modern material altogether above. But right now there's just zero relationship and um, the two sections definitely need to speak to each other. Um, another question I would have um, is really about the space that you're creating, the retail space, that triangulated space is very challenging for a retail or a restaurant. You know, I'm, I'm just thinking too about, um, you know, how much street frontage there, there is and in any retail or restaurant space, trying to carve out a kitchen or a back of house um, just becomes really challenging without actually cutting off a certain amount of that um, that long um, front facade and having to black out windows because you make something a, a back of house because there just isn't currently a space for it. So that's something I'd, I'd like you to, to take a look at is whether there's a way to, um, to, to make that space more, more usable. And you know perhaps as Kin was suggesting, when you look at activating those three windows that we're looking at on the side, the arched, the large arched windows and re locating some of the programmatic elements that are shoved up against it, you know, perhaps that allows you to reorient some of the, the space to make that more useful in the commercial space. I am disappointed with the amount of commercial space that was lost here. I don't know if looking at the second floor as perhaps um, uh, commercial office space, co-working space, or something of that nature for a portion of it is something that you've taken a look at at all. But I think that that's something that I'd like you to address when you come back. Um, it's it's really a shame that the amount of commercial space that was there is is lost. And if it's not possible because of the parking requirements on the first floor, I'd like to see you at least consider um, a, a a creative use of some of the second floor space for commercial or office space as well. Um, Let's see, I talked a little bit about the design approach, um, the building lobby as, as well. Um, you know, I think it's certainly a challenge, or challenge for vis visitors right now. There's, there's no demarcation of the entrance for the residential units at all. So that's something I'd like to see addressed. Are you signing that? Is that anywhere here on the building? I think the um, department mentioned this a little bit in their memo as well. Um, and uh, I think that's plenty for, to, to go through for, for uh, our next conversation. So with that, um, I would, sorry, go ahead, Ken. Um, just before we uh, close off uh, our, our bit, uh, I, one of the things that uh, you guys are totally correct is there's a bottom building and a top building. And one of the things I might look at, suggest that you might look at is integrating colors. Yeah, that may, that may work better. So if, um, window frames and trim is the same on both buildings or um, the siding is, is in more uh, earth tone colors as the brick. It may, it may look like a more of, um, homogenous building there as opposed to just one building sitting on top of the other. You might, I might, that might be a suggestion for you to look at, okay? Um, and Rachel, I can add, I mean, I think maybe even this uh, graphic kind of gives you an idea, like the roof line is so stark in contrast with the um, Capitol um, Theater building. I mean, even if you can kind of get a little bit more creative with what you're doing on the roof line so that it has that feeling that the part of the massing and part of why it works here I think is because you have some history of height down this corridor but you want to have it relate to that history and what in terms of that facade. Thanks Melissa and Ken I think those are excellent points I think again looking at that corner there at Mass Ave and, and Lake Street I mean that's a that's a prominent corner and it's not being treated as a prominent corner um, in the way that the facade is currently designed right now so that's an opportunity. 
Any other comments before I open this up for public comment? Yeah, I'd just like to say one thing. Uh, the town came out with this net zero action plan, and there are two pieces relating to this building that I'd like you to take a look at and report back next time. And the whole point is so that new buildings um, are basically net zero carbon. So one is uh, require, it's, not, it's not a requirement yet, but it's in the net zero action plan that the buildings at least be solar ready. So I'd like you to take a look at what it would take to make this building solar ready if it doesn't actually have solar on it. And the second is so that there's no um, internal fossil fuel combustion used for the building. So I'd like you to report back on that next time, too. Great. Thank you, Dean. And the action, the Nether action plans online if you'd like to get a copy, town website. Thank you very much. So with that, we will uh, open this up for public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak uh, about this, uh, to ask any questions or uh, make any comments, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, please also, if you could keep your comments brief, I would like to get to as many of you as possible, and I'm going to apologize in advance when I need to close uh, this public comment. There will be future hearings, um, and we will uh, make sure that uh, this is placed on an agenda where we have more time for public comments at that time. Uh, but I will be closing public comments at 7.55. When I call on you, please remember to state your first, last name, and address for the record. The first speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I get, begin, I have provided some visuals, which I'd like to be shared at this time. Uh, if you could please start while Jenny pulls those up, your time sure. is running. On Seltzer Irving Street, a 37 unit apartment building is a development that is appropriate for an R7 lot of more than 20,000 square feet, not in a B3 village business district on only 11,000 square feet. It simply can't work except by resorting to some very strange mathematics. The first step is subtraction. You have to subtract out all of the, uh, so let me buy all references to open space, whether usable or landscape. You have to subtract out the requirement for a rear yard setback based upon building size. In this case, about 32 feet. I'm sure the next door neighbors in the garden apartment won't mind this submission. Next to be subtracted out is the requirement for upper story setbacks on Chandler Street and in Lake Street. And then we just throw out the bylaw for corner lots and minimum side street fronted setbacks. The final trick is, trickiest operation is multiplication. How to convince this board that is perfectly okay to take the maximum permitted floor area ratio of 1.5 and multiply it by a factor of three. Can I have the next slide, Jenny? Um, moving on to geometry, I have provided the board with some perspective views that are not based upon some unusual non-Euclidean geometry. They're crude, but they are scaled realistically according to real life objects, specifically the 30 foot utility poles on the street. Uh, next slide. The front view, which I just sh uh, showed, is from Mass Ave near the F Fox Library. Um, here's what the applicant has provided for Lake Street. Notice that that's a 30 foot utility pole and it's a 60 foot building. Next slide. This is a view of what it's gonna look like from Lake Street showing how the 60 foot structure stacks up against its neighbor. And I'll just cut it off there and let other people speak. Thank you very much. Um, so looking at time, um, I am going to go ahead and take all of the people that have their hands raised. Um, so uh, the last speaker will be Stephanie uh, Hansel. So um, we'll go ahead with Steve Revelak next. Good evening, Madam Chair. Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, I realize this is the first hearing for the proposal, but I like the general direction of the project. 
Uh, there are a couple of specific comments I'd like to make. Uh, first, I see this would be a five-story building situated between two three-story buildings. Um, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm fine with that configuration. Um, I think there's, there could be a nice symmetry there. Uh, second, uh, going back to what the board mentioned earlier, uh, there's a relationship between the surrounding buildings. So on one side, we've got the Capitol Theater, which is one of Arlington's more iconic buildings. It's three stories, mostly red brick, quite a bit of decorative trim, hemispheric stone ornaments, and, and so on. And on the other side, you have 180 Mass Ave. Again, it's a three-story red brick building, but it's got very little trim or ornamentation. Um, so I'd suggest going with a brick facade at least on the first three floors, either real brick or if you could get, you know, brick and fiber cement panels, that would be fine too. But just something that blends in better with the surrounding buildings. Uh, doing something different on the upper two stories might be fine, but I, I would really like to see brick on the bottom three. Uh, I'd also like the applicants to consider trim detail. So 180 has very little trim. The Capitol's theater has quite a bit of trim. So having, you know, less trim than the Capitol, but more than 180, just so that there's a transition from building to building to building, I, I think that would, would help with the look on the street. And finally, I'd like to suggest putting the entrance or one of the entrances to the first floor commercial spaces on the corner, uh, similar to the way the entrance to Otto's is situated on the other side of Lake Street. So the idea is to have some symmetry of those corners on either side of Lake. Uh, thank you for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next speaker will be Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, Adam Street. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, I guess what I, what I would say, Madam Chair, uh, first off is I appreciate that the applicant's attorney does not want to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals, but it seems to me that's exactly where this proposal needs to go. And it needs to go there, first of all, for a variance if the applicant wants a special permit from the Redevelopment Board, because this application blatantly violates the zoning bylaw. As Mr. Benson pointed out, it is about three times the allowed floor area ratio. There is zero usable open space. It doesn't come close to meeting the requirements of the bylaw. And in order for your board to get, grant a special permit, it needs a variance first. Otherwise, the applicant can go before the Zoning Board of Appeals for a 40B permit if they wish. And I understand the attorney for the applicant has played that card. I suggest you let them play that. Um, Otherwise, they, they need the variance. And Mr. Benson posed the question of whether your board has the authority to allow the zoning bylaw to be violated. I suggest it absolutely does not. And simply um, hearing from the attorney that he thinks it's, you can do that is not good enough. I would like him, I would like town council to cite any case law that allows planning boards to grant variances or allows the process of site plan review to provide a variance because they will not be able to do it. And I say to the abutters who received the legal notice in the mail for the ARB to approve this project as it has been submitted will be a blatant violation of the law. It could very easily be overturned on appeal and you should know that because you have the power to stop them from engaging in this kind of lawlessness. Thank you. The next speaker will be Phil Goff. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Phil Goff. I live on uh, Grafton Street, which is just a couple blocks from the site. And I, I do visit Capitol Square typically a couple times a week. So I'm there a lot. And I'm certainly very familiar with the site. Um, I think, you know, generally the massing strategy, um, you know, despite some of the issues some have said and the, just the overall development program, I don't think they're, they're too bad. Uh, in many ways, I think I think what's proposed here is really what a lot of people in town have been saying they've wanted over the years, that we wanna have mixed use, higher density buildings on Mass Ave. And here we, we're, here we have a mixed use, higher density building on Mass Ave. Um, the strategy, that strategy is it's in the master plan. It's been discussed at town meeting. I know a lot of people who support that concept. And I also, I like that the parking ratio is low, so it cuts down on traffic issues, that a fifth of the building, 20% of the building will be affordable units. The historic uh, bank facade is retained. It's promoting walking and, uh, walking and transit, obviously. Uh, it's a nice unit mix that will, that will draw, you know, basically singles and couples and it'll have really minimal impact on our schools. So that sort of saves us all money. So I think that's, 
something that many in the neighborhood and really throughout town uh, very much are supportive of. So I also wanted to say that despite those positives uh, about the overall program, I do have some concerns about the design um, that I'd like to relay to the folks here at the ARB and the developers and the architects. First, the ground floor plan. I think the reduction of the commercial retail restaurant space from the 9,000 square foot there today to 2,000, it's a bitter, a bitter pill to swallow given how important the site is. Um, the proposed reduction of the parking ratio, it's appreciated, but you know, the parking still does generally dominate the ground floor. So, but I noticed that as shown, the curb cut to the parking area is already four, maybe even five feet below the grade of Mass Ave sidewalks. So really just providing a modest ramp within the building would allow another drop of four, four to five feet so that the parking area could easily tuck itself under the first floor, uh, given that the, the grade differential with Mass Ave. That would allow the parking to be sort of partially underground, I guess. So obviously there's that excavation cost, but you could probably easily double the retail square footage by putting, by tucking the parking in under it and taking advantage of being creative with the, the slight grade change that I think could really make a big difference. And I think the developer and owner will make more money from the lease rate from the retail uh, and offset the cost of some of that excavation. Uh, I did want to talk about uh, the design uh, that I think has been covered pretty well. I do, to me, it looks like a, a two to four story building kind of flown in from the suburbs and kind of plopped on top of a, a pretty nicely designed uh, residential or urban base. So I won't talk about that anymore. Last thing I did want to just quickly mention is the bike parking strategy. I think it's great that uh, the project includes the um, bike parking rooms on the second and third floor. I think that would be great if someone for those that own expensive bikes, mountain bikes, road bikes, uh, e-bikes. But I think for those who live in the building and many of them won't have cars, they're gonna have their kind of day-to-day -day commuter bike. And I think it will be more of an annoyance to have to go in the elevator up and down into the locked bike room. So I would suggest more bike racks, long-term bike racks within the footprint of the parking area, whether it's at grade or hopefully halfway below grade. So I'm that's sorry, it. you're, you're at time. Great start, and I appreciate it, and I hope those modest changes could be made. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Adam Oster. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, uh, as Phil just said, uh, oh, I live at 10 Cottage Ave uh, in East Arlington, a walking distance to Capitol Square. Uh, I go there uh, almost every day. Um, uh, as Phil just said, there's a lot to like about this project. I'm a town meeting member, and in many respects, this is the sort of thing I voted for when I voted uh, for the mixed use bylaw. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, the thing I dislike the most, which is the loss of the retail space and particularly the, uh, the street experience of walking by what's essentially a parking garage. Um, I realize this is a constrained site. Uh, I know there needs to be parking. Uh, I don't know what to do about it, but I really hope that in the give and take that is this process that the applicant and the redevelopment board can fix that, can improve that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker uh, will be Elaine. Hi there, um, this is Elaine Maynard, and uh, I live at 13 Chandler Street, uh, which is the um, home uh, directly in back of this building. Um, and I uh, had a couple of comments of, of things for consideration and to uh, raise a, a couple of concerns. Um, there is a neighborhood behind this building, so I, I recognize that a lot of the talk um, has been about Mass Ave and about Lake Street, um, but we have had less of a conversation uh, about Chandler Street and the residents on Chandler Street, um, and particularly those of us who um, will be uh, looking at this building um, as part of their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so I have a couple of concerns about Chandler Street in general. Um, one is the impact of traffic. Um, I recognize that the um, the parking footprint of this is low, um, but I also recognize that 37 units um, at some point or time is going to bring visitors. 
Uh, and my question is, where, is the, where are those visitors going to park? Um, and I fear that the answer is Chandler Street. Um, I think there's also the impact of uh, trucks and um, just uh, services that are being provided to the building. And again, how that affects Chandler Street. Uh, I believe that I read in the documentation, um, but there hadn't been a traffic report um, done related to Chandler Street. So if I have that correct, um, I would um, you know, like to ask that, that some sort of assessment of, of that be done. Um, obviously, we also have concerns about general light and noise um, and how that affects the experience of, of people living behind the building. Um, and Jen, then just lastly, I think that this has been addressed uh, previously, um, but there is the aesthetic of the building and particularly the backside of this building um, that essentially abuts to, to my home. Um, I think one of the um, gentlemen uh, mentioned having something that was uh, more attractive than just a, a kind of a flat back wall. Um, so I would, uh, you know, like folks to look at um, an alternative to make the back side of the building um, something that is more attractive and in line with the fact that there is a um, residential neighborhood behind this building. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Kelly Doherty. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great, Kelly Doherty, I'm at 12 Chandler. And basically I agree completely with the points that, that Elaine has broached. Uh, my home is opposite uh, hers, so I don't abut the property, but it is the view from my front yard. So <laughs> it's definitely of great interest to me. I do appreciate those on the board that commented about the brick facade. I think it would be a far more aesthetic, uh, appearance wise and consistent with the existing neighborhood structures if uh, that were looked at. I also wanna reiterate that my concern is not just the traffic for the residents, um, but also the visitors and the loading and unloading, which I don't believe is going to be happening on Mass Ave because of the presence of a bus stop. Uh, it's not gonna be happening on Lake Street because of the intersection. So that means anybody who's getting an Uber or a Lyft is likely to be meeting that car <laughs> on Chandler Street. And remember, there is a big parking lot behind the adjacent um, Cambridge Savings Bank building that, that is, the, is the more plain a brick building. So there's already a lot of activity behind these buildings in terms of parking, um, offloading, dumpsters, the commercial um, trash and recycling pickups do not jive with the residential. And then I also want you to consider that with 37 units, if, especially if they're rentals, these people do not stay for decades at a time, they move every three years. So if everyone moves every three years, that means we're gonna have a moving truck basically in my front yard and probably Elaine's front yard uh, once a month. That's typically on the weekends. And that's, that's assuming the whole apartment moves, not just uh, two roommates splitting up. And that doesn't count the new people moving in. So it would really be double that. So there's a lot of very urban activity that is being sort of forced onto Chandler Street because Lake is not viable and because of the bus stop on Mass Ave. So I just want the board to consider that in, in what they're reviewing. The other thing I did note that with the parking garage entrance on Chandler, the flashing lights and the warning sounds for the sidewalk protections are basically right there next to residential homes. And again, we get the backup sirens in the winter for the clearing of the uh, parking lot next door. Um, so we just want people to understand there's a cumulative effect that, that is really strongly affecting the Chandler neighborhood. Um, I do think that a mixed use is appropriate there I do think further development is gonna happen there. We all acknowledge that. Uh, we want it to be aesthetically pleasing and we would like to see a lower density. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Matt Fernandez. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am Matt Fernandez. I am at 15 Mass Ave across the street, at uh, the Summit House. Some of you might know by that name. 
Um, just a couple of questions that weren't addressed, I guess, in the presentation, and mostly hovering around the construction timeline. How long will it take? How will it impact us living here in terms of um, taking a bus? Where will the bus stop be located during this construction? What will happen to the sidewalk? And uh, will this be owner or tenant occupied? So just a couple of questions on like the logistics and how this is gonna happen and how that's gonna affect people in, in the building and surrounding communities throughout the construction and the, uh, and the, the development. Great, thank you. We will ask the uh, applicant to address those when they return for their next hearing. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Laura Hayes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yep, my name is Laura Curtis Hayes. I live at 5 Cleveland Street, uh, immediately behind the Capitol Square Business District, um, so I can see the property from our front windows. Uh, after almost 15 years in the planning profession in the greater Boston area, I am generally supportive of upper story development in village centers. It makes a lot of sense. But as with most things, um, the project's success depends on you know, overall design and organization. And on those points, I am opposed to the way it is currently laid out. Um, chiefly, the project is too large for its lot. Um, I don't see any relation between a lot of FAR 1.5 and a proposed FAR 4.1. And it's a significant disconnect that basically shows that the project is trying to do too much on that lot. Um, a 37 unit residential project is not a small project um, and a property zoning requirement should give both the property owner and its neighbors a sense of predictability when it comes to future development and 4.1 FAR just seems way out of line. Um, everybody has talked about the reduction in commercial space, so I don't want to talk about that too much, except that it does kind of seem like this is a residential project that's kind of fronting as a mixed use project because it's retaining such a small amount of commercial frontage on Mass Ave. Um, I really do not like the removal of commercial storefronts on Lake Street and replacing those with garage ventilation openings. Um, as somebody who walks in the square daily, this is um, pretty upsetting for me. And I think that space should remain commercial storefront either by removing parking along the edge or in some fashion. Um, one of the main amenities of the Capitol Square is how walkable it is. And I think that any new project should support that pedestrian experience. Um, the new garage opening on Chandler Street, I think um, since it has no setback from the sidewalk, does it really create a safety hazard? Um, there's many school children, including mine, who use Chandler Street as a main thoroughfare to go to Hardy School every day. And um, not having any sort of setback so that vehicles entering or exiting can see them really um, is concerning. And as for a new building, it, it really shouldn't happen. Um, it should be recessed in some fashion. And I don't think a warning signal um, really meets that standard. Um, Finally, uh, along the front of the building, um, the existing building has recessed storefronts or, and door openings and detailing between the storefronts. Um, and this one basically is just flat windows. I think it really needs um, better articulation, um, maybe some recessed doorways, something along those lines. Um, which leads to my last main point um, that besides being overly large for the site, I, uh, as we've all said, I don't think this is an attractive building design. Um, there's no, no cohesiveness between the first floor and the upper levels, um, and there's nothing to relate it to the rest of the square. Um, it kind of just looks really out of place, and um, I don't think anybody would want that in such a prominent location. So I'm excited to see the next redesign. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker uh, will be Stephanie Hansel, which will be our uh, final speaker. James, uh, before Stephanie speaks, I see that you raised your hand, um, but I, I uh, closed the speaker list. So um, if you would like to address us at the end of this meeting or at the next time or in written format, we'd love to take your comments that way. Sure, sorry, uh, I, I, I translate, so my, my fault. No problem, James. Uh, so Stephanie Hansel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hansel. I live on 3 Cleveland Street. I live literally steps from Mass Ave and from the building at number 190. I grew up here in East Arlington and I went to Hardy School and I feel very connected to the past, present and future of Arlington, in particular East Arlington. So I feel really um, honored to be able to make these comments. 
And I'm here tonight to voice my strong opposition to the current design and proposal. As others have noted, um, this space is located in a village business district of which there are only three in Arlington. And the proposed development is clearly a residential project in a business zone. It does not fulfill the, the bylaws for this zone, which are to which mean that the predominant use of the zone is for commercial and retail space. And the reduction from 10,000 square feet to the proposed 2,000 square feet is a tragedy. Our town really cannot afford to lose this precious business space in the heart of one of three village business districts. I do believe as many others have stated, and I'm very concerned about the gross manipulation of the FAR. Um, I don't see how a 4.1 FAR can be approved when 1.5 is the maximum allowed. I know the planning department uh, staff letter referenced the Capitol Square or the Capitol Theater building as being 2.6, the, the floor area ratio. That was of course pre-zoning bylaws. And so I actually looked to the adjacent building for a more contemporary FAR. And so the 180 uh, bank building uh, I called the assessor's office and it seems that that FAR is one. So uh, an, a building that is massive as being as massive as the one proposed uh, with such a high density is just completely out of place in this square. And I don't believe that the number or, or that the housing being proposed is really quality housing. Of course, affordable housing is desi desired, but an extremely high density building with a predominance of small and undersized units really doesn't meet the needs, the housing needs of Arlington. Some of the units are even less than 400 square feet. So I really would encourage the board to consider that this is a massive out of place building. As others have noted, the aesthetics are awful. It doesn't look like it's, it belongs in Capitol Square. We've worked really hard as a community to make Capitol Square a place that is really special and a place that is um, unique in Arlington. And I don't believe that this building in the heart of that zone accomplishes that or adds to that at all. This is a golden opportunity to revitalize this valuable space. Let's use this opportunity wisely for present generations and, and those to come. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we will close uh, public comment for uh, docket number 3650 for this evening. Um, let's see, so I will uh, turn this back to the board uh, to see if there are any uh, final comments uh, that you would like to make to the uh, applicant. And then we will uh, identify a, uh, a time for a continue continuation of this uh, of this public hearing. So I'll start with Ken. Any any final thoughts or, or questions? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I think the um, opponent heard quite a bit and they, they should be able to uh, come back with uh, a much richer and better project. Great, thanks. Gene? Yeah, I'd just say I think a lot of the comments from the public were spot on and and either added to or amplified um, some of the comments that the board made. And um, I would like to see them come back with something with a much smaller FAR. I'm going to have a very difficult or impossible time with a FAR of four where the mixed use specifically says it can't go above one. 0.5. So the fact that this is mixed use has nothing to do with our ability to go so much higher in the FAR. Uh, Melissa. Um, I think I'll just reiterate, I guess, the, the rethink on how we could look at the commercial space loss. Um, I do think that is important, as everyone said. Um, and then also, I'd be curious about, I'm just, I, I think I'm, uh, I need to talk to staff a little bit. I'm curious more on how the parking is situated. I think it just feels like we're not sharing the parking and if we're reducing it, maybe we should be a little more creative with how we're considering that or undergrounding the parking. I, I wanna know a little bit more on how this kind of the performa on something like this. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Bob, did you have any questions on uh, any of the the, the comments uh, before we before we close no, and I, uh, continue I, this to a future date? No, I do not. I think we have some homework to do, so Great. I'm looking forward to the next date. Great, and we really look forward to working with you to, uh, to continue, uh, hopefully, finding a way to bring this project to life. So thank you. Uh, so we are looking for a date, uh, Jenny, and to continue this this hearing too. Can you uh, speak to what our next available date would be? Yeah, May 3rd. May 3rd. Bob, John? does that work for you and your team? John? All set with that. Sounds good. Good, good, good for, uh, with May 3rd. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So do I hear a motion from the board to continue docket 3650 to May 3rd? So move. Is there a second? Second. Great, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So thank you all. And we will see you again on May 3rd. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so with that, we will move to uh, agenda item number two, which is the continuation of the uh, zoning warrant article public hearings for 2021 annual town meeting. So this is our fourth of four nights of hearings as published in the schedule on Novus agenda uh, for the total of 22 warrant articles. Consistent with the past, the ARB will be hearing from article applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. Applicants will have three minutes to address the board. The board will then pose any questions to the applicants followed by a period for open public comment. Note that the board will be uh, reserving final discussion until after we've closed the public hearing, which will be this evening. Um, and before we begin, let me run through the procedures for anyone who wishes to speak at the public hearing for either of the two items that are on our agenda for this evening. So the scope of the public hearing is a subject matter as posted in tonight's agenda. Any person wishing to address the redevelopment board on the subject matter shall signify your desire to speak by raising your hand when I announce consideration of each item. To raise your hand in Zoom, go to the participant section and select raise hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak, you will be, uh, you'll preface your comments by giving your first, last name and street address. Each person addressing the board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall li limit their remarks to three minutes. Uh, you may be allowed to speak more than once at the discretion of the chair, if you have a new and different point to make or a question to ask on the topic. The board may receive any oral or written evidence but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly re repetitious evidence may be excluded. Those people present at public hearing are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manners, manner. And all speakers should address questions through the chair Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with ARB members or the hearing participants. Questions may or may not be able to be answered during the public hearing. So with that, we will move to the first article for this evening, which is Article 35, uh, which is the zoning bylaw amendment relative to industrial uses. Uh, so I will turn this over to Erin. Uh, Are you going to be doing the speaking? Yeah, um, I have um, a short presentation. Um, uh, Rachel, verbal presentation. Rachel, I just want to let you know I am now present. Well, thank you so much, David. I appreciate you announcing that. Thank you. Great. Eric, um, do you, does uh, Eric also need to, is he on? Eric Halverson? He is. Okay. He is on. Okay. Um, we uh, do not have slides, so um, I'm just have a short verbal presentation. Um, so thank you, Rachel, for the time to make a statement regarding the proposed zoning amendments for the industrial districts. I would like to thank the staff at RKG and Harriman who guided the department in the zoning bylaw working group through this project. Eric Halverson from RKG I don't know what you're talking about. Well, is in attendance tonight as well to provide additional response to questions where expertise on market and fiscal analysis is helpful. 
Uh, thank you also to the zoning bylaw working group members who are here as well. The proposed amendments for the industrial district are first and foremost to address the antiquated table of uses and density and dimensional requirements that are preventing the attraction of new and modern uses, such as biotechnology, research and development, and food and beverage production. The proposed amendments come directly from the master plan, which recommended updating the industrial district to adapt um, current uh, current market uh, to adapt to current market needs and, spe and included specific actions. The proposed zoning amendment adds new uses to the table of uses um, to include such uses as flex uses, artists live workspaces, food protection, production, vertical agriculture, breweries and the similar, larger restaurants and storage facilities. These uses are in addition to the existing artistic and creative production uses that are currently allowed either by right or by special permit in the district. The proposed zoning amendment includes development standards for any new construction or additions greater than 50% and acknowledge um, and support other efforts that are important to the town of Arlington. There is a significant emphasis on incorporating sustainability measures and stormwater management measures as recommended in the net zero action plan and the Millbrook corridor report. Acknowledging the fact that the industrial districts are in close proximity to residential districts, the standards also emphasize the need for develop to develop human scale buildings, pedestrian amenities, and consider um, building height within the context of the surrounding neighborhood. What the zoning amendments can address though is Arlington's lack of access both to highway and rail and to rapid transit that many of Arlington's neighboring communities have and are seeing growth in life sciences and in other emerging industries. Since the first quarter of 2017, no industrial properties have been listed for sale in Arlington. With so much owner occupied property and so little turnover in our industrial districts, either through sale or lease, there has been little incentive for property owners to consider redeveloping their property to create opportunities to bring new and modern light industrial research and development, manufacturing and the creative economy to the industrial districts. By allowing residential and mixed use projects, the turnover may be incentivized by balancing the investment and the requirements with some profitability avoiding long-term stagnation in these districts. But the proposed zoning is not just about allowing residential uses. It is also allowing for flexible uses, breweries and the like, food production and carefully eliminating unnecessary constraints that exist in the zoning bylaw to meet the needs of the end user by allowing greater first floor ceiling heights within reason and eliminating restrictions on how floor space may be used by offices, manufacturers and light industry. The DPCD memo on the proposed zoning does concede the, that the amount of residential could be reduced to a closer to a 50-50 split between industrial, commercial, and residential. The main driver of profitability for redevelopment then becomes the size of the parcel when considering all of the aspects of the proposed zoning. As written, the residential floor area cannot be two, more than two times the light industrial floor area on the ground floor. Light industrial is written to include breweries, distilleries, and wineries, flex space, food production, in addition to what is already allowed in the zoning. And please note that self-storage facilities are in the use category of commercial and storage uses and is not considered light industry. In response to comments that were received via correspondence on this matter, the cost per pupil noted does not deduct the state aid and grants received by the Arlington School Department. The school department provided RKG with an actual number of uh, just under $7,300 per pupil, which was confirmed through RKG's fiscal modeling efforts. In the example in recent correspondence, it results in a total of $189,722 for school costs from the Brigham Square apartments, not the $668,000 stated. By comparing that against the Brigham property taxes, it actually generates more tax revenue in total than 22 Mill Street. Further, 22 Mill Street was not overlooked in the analysis, as noted in recent correspondence. RKG provided significant detail on the office condominiums at 22 Mill Street during the first zoning bylaw working group meeting on this project. The proposed zoning allows office spaces in the industrial district and removes the restrictive floor space requirements in order to provide flexibility again for the end user. Overall, the proposed zoning seeks to balance the needs of a modern industrial zoning with the realities of Arlington's position in the region to attract new uses. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And again, Eric Halverson from RKG is here to support um, 
if questions in his expertise come up. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Erin. I will now uh, run through the members of the board for any questions, and we'll start with Ken. Uh, thank you. This is a pretty good um, summary of a, a lot of work, and you guys did a good job at this. I appreciate this uh, greatly. Um, only question I have right now is, uh, when you guys looked at the industrial zone, um, if we're trying to transform this into, say, a, a community or a sort of a village, something like that, um, how much of that zone that's there right now have sidewalks and curbs? So it's um, it's pretty scattered um, throughout the various districts. Um, certainly um, in the Dudley Street area, which is um, one of the industrial districts that also includes quite a bit of existing residential, the sidewalk condition is um, relatively non-existent. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, driveway entrances um, where the edge of the property just blends into um, the street, um, which is why the zoning, the proposed zoning does focus on creating um, better uh, pedestrian amenities and also does set a setback um, from the, the property line to, to provide a little bit more um, relief from the edge of the street um, where it meets the property. So where there is no sidewalk and curb, uh, it's the responsibility of uh, the owner of, of that property adjacent to it, or is it the city will look into potentially um, helping out with inf uh, infrastructure there to encourage more in this? I'm just wondering how what we can do here to support this? Um, so the sidewalk is typically in the right of way, um, which would be the town's responsibility. Um, however, I think that there could be um, some room for discussion on that um, because of the, the fact that the, the edge of the property um, and the road sort of all blends together. That's um, the example on Dudley Street is just one example. Um, the industrial districts are throughout the um, town um, and the condition does vary in different uh, districts. All right. Uh, I think that's all I have for now, Rachel. I, I mean, I think this is a, a, a good example of what to do there. I just want to, you know, look back at some of the edges, the fringes, where um, what, what we can do to encourage this. I think the sidewalk and trees along those areas would help a lot. Great. Thank you, Ken. Gene? Yeah, thank you. And thank you to the staff and consultants and the committees working on this. I think this is a really excellent work and will, I think, very much greatly benefit the town going forward. I do have a number of questions and suggestions. So the first has to do with the split between residential and industrial and I know some of us at the last presentation about this asked to go back and look at, at that. It looks like the work was done. <clears throat> but my question is, since there does seem to be a split between large parcels, which probably could work financially with 50% residential, 50% industrial, and the small ones, which probably could not, why not make that distinction? I'm not sure what the exact square footage is, but let's just say, for example, you know, any parcel less than 10,000 square feet would have exactly what you have in here for the mix of residential and industrial, but any parcel larger than that, that may not, that may be not the right cutoff, would be limited to no more than 50%. And I just wondered if that was considered based upon what we've now read about the size of the parcel making a difference. So um, it, it could be a consideration. Um, I think it uh, potentially overcomplicates um, the zoning amendment. Um, and to be clear, the smaller parcels um, 
could support the 50-50 split. It just, it makes it um, the development uh, pro forma work out uh, better when um, you're, when you are able to add that second floor of residential. Um, so it's, uh, it's more to keep the, the, um, the zoning streamlined and consistent across the uh, different sizes of parcels. Um, and, and to be clear, um, it would be feasible for a smaller parcel size. It just drives the type of development that might be considered in a different, in a different way than say some of the larger parcels. Um, uh, does that answer the question, Jean? Um, yeah, I can yeah. also see if Eric has anything else to add, um, but uh, we can also move on as well. Yeah, I guess if you or Eric could say, if you did have to draw a line between you know, parcel size, ones where we would limit it to 50% residential maximum and ones where we would allow the two to one, where would you draw that line on parcel size? So I would say that the, um, based on the average size of the parcels, um, being that it is uh, just uh, looking for that, um, note, um, I believe that the average size is just over 6,000 um, square feet um, that are not improved for commercial or industrial uses. Um, I would say that that probably would be um, the threshold to consider. Um, parcels that are larger than that um, could uh, likely support the one story of, of residential spaces, but those smaller size parcels um, around that average would be where um, the line might need to be drawn. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. I think if that's the average, some might be a little larger, some might be a little smaller. So maybe like 10,000 square feet mm -hmm. would give some margin that might be necessary. I'd like to hear what the other members of the board have to say when they, talk about this because I don't think it would complicate this a lot to just say if the parcel's above 10,000 square feet, it's no more than a one-to-one. -one. And if the parcel is 10,000 square feet or less, they can go up to two-to-one. Um, so I'm sort of interested in what the other members have to say um, about that. If we could go to page nine next, Jenny. Um, where it says all new commercial and mixed use buildings shall be solar ready. I have two questions about that. Um, one is how about if there's substantial renovations to existing buildings, why are not we requiring that for them? And I'll wait till you respond to that. The, um, it might be um, I believe that um, it's uh, it was just an acknowledgement of the fact that um, the additions may not um, be vertical additions, but it's certainly something that we could add in. I, I think it would be helpful because you know if you're, if you're going to not do a substantial renovation then, I understand that it becomes um, difficult to, to do it, but if you're doing a substantial renovation, then it probably makes sense. And it should probably say be solar ready or also have solar on them, you know? Um, next one I have is also on that page. Um, the lighting, which is down at the bottom, of that page, which I think is is fine. I just wondered if there's any consideration to require the outdoor lighting to be certified as dark sky friendly because there is a process in which outdoor lighting fixtures get certified as dark sky friendly, which I think might be a little bit better than the downcast is cut off or fully shielded. So um, I'd like, to have consideration of that. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Um, so now the next page, which is 10. Exceptions to maximum height regulations in the industrial district. It talks about um, new development or additions otherwise subject to a maximum height of 52 feet or four stories is allowed, subject to the following um, development standards. I'm a little concerned about that because that happens to be shading a residence that has solar on it 50% of the time. I think we've defeated the purpose. And I think the two options to deal with that are not allow it if buildings currently have solar because we don't want them um, to be shadowed at least 50% of the time by a new building, or there needs to be a method in which the new building recompenses the building that has solar for the fact that they've now taken away half or a large percentage of their solar gain. So I'm not sure what to do about that, but I don't think this specifically gets at what I think would be a problem in some circumstances. And I think it, it does need to do that. Um, then when it comes to starting on 10, provide one of the following sustainable roof infrastructure components, and it lists four of them. But earlier in the regulations, it talks about at least 50% of the roof being at least solar ready. And if we're having um, vegetated or green roof over more than 50% of the roof area, it seems to me that contradicts the earlier statement elsewhere in the regulations that at least 50% of the roof area needs to be solar ready. Same thing with the blue roof. So I think the way to fix this, because I think solar ready is more important, is something like the remainder of the roof or something like that mm -hmm. um, would, would be able to do this. Um, yep. Let me see. On page 12. Down at the very bottom, I don't think you need the parenthetical ARB. It's not really necessary. It's not done anywhere else in the bylaw. Um, I'm curious also on the next page why. Um, work only artist studios shall not be used by more than two artists. I'm familiar with some other places in the area where you have more than two artists sharing an artist's studio. So I'm wondering what was the thinking to limit this to no more than two artists? So the, the thinking here um, was to um, be able to um, per, was to be able to provide more spaces for artists to work um, but uh, and that is that is something that did come up it was expanded um, and the um, occasional and time limited collaborations with other artists were um, to expand upon that um, but we can certainly, uh, you know, delete that. I don't think that it is, uh, uh, would change the intent of the requirement. Well, either that or maybe talk to ACA and see if they have a suggestion on how to deal with that, or, or, or I would say, um, you know, not needed. Um, okay. On page 14, about halfway done, it's something described as the Zoning Board of Appeals, but in the bylaws, they're really just called the Board of Appeals. Um, the last line in 14 should say, in this by in, in these by this bylaw, not in the town of Arlington bylaws. Do you see where I am there? Yep. Okay. Um, page 15, page 15, number five, where it says all parking surfaces shall comply. I think it all has to say 
is comply with the requirements of section 3.4.4 open paren E close paren period. Okay. You don't need all those other parts in there. Um, the, the only other thing, and this related to um, one of the things you pointed out, Erin, in that this proposes adding a same section that the ADUs proposed adding um, with the same number. But I'm wondering whether it wouldn't be better to put the um, sec this section on industrial zoning that you mentioned there at the end of the section on industrial zoning. So it would be, it would be, you would, you could add it as, um, where is it now? After the development standards. Yeah, after the development standards. And yeah, before. so we, um, we did go back and forth on the positioning of this section um, that the 592, or yep, 592. Right. Um, originally, those standards that you see were in the definitions, and we moved them out of the definitions to be consistent right. with that how we sense. write definitions. Yeah, right. um, the section 59 is additional standards for permitted uses. So it did feel like this was the best um, spot for it. I think that. Um, Maybe. I think that this can be dealt with administratively, um, you know, depending on uh, where the two discussions go um, relative to the two articles. Um, but uh, it, it, it the, the selection of putting it in the section five nine was deliberate, um, and I think is the the right location for it based okay. on you know other usage of that section. Yeah, because again, I think creating a 5.6.4 would be another place for it, which is right after the use regulations um, in those zones. So I'd say just consider that. And, you know, I know some of these are a little picky comments. I'm sorry to be picky because overall, I think this is really, as I said before, great work and will really benefit the town. Thank you, Jean. Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David. Uh, having spent a lot of time on this uh, with the zoning bylaw working group, uh, I very much appreciate uh, Gene's detailed and astute comments from uh, his having taken a, taken a fresher look at it uh, than those of us who have, have seen it for quite some time. Uh, I think the only thing I wanted to uh, highlight was um, my, uh, I, I, was one of those with a concern over the uh, uh, inclusion of residential use in the industrial districts. And um, while I recognize the necessity based on the economic analysis, uh, I would be supportive of, of an idea like Gene suggested of perhaps applying a, uh, a stricter standard to larger parcels uh, so that we could potentially uh, maximize the, the commercial space in, in those parcels to a greater extent. Great, thank you, David. Uh, Melissa. Um, I don't have much more than I think that this is, you know, great work and it's, you know, the, the move, even though it's kind of later than the master plan, you mentioned, you know, a few years out, it's been great to see the implementation. So I think this is good work. Great, thank you, Melissa. The only question I had, and now of course I'm struggling to find exactly where it was. There was a reference to um, the uh, step back requirements. Um, and I believe, did you cover this already, Jean? No, they just, we just get rid of them for these buildings. Okay, great. Because there was a, a reference that, you know, for those over, those that are four stories, um, it would start at the third story. And again, I think that that's something we had, we had, my question was, was that in the intent? I know that we had changed it because it was an um, incorrect reference um, in for the setback requirements in other parts of the zoning bylaw, 
or or do we just eliminate it here as as Jean was was referencing? Um, so uh, it's actually on the bottom of page eight of our memo, Jenny. Um, there, um, in the existing zoning, um, there is uh, two uh, different levels of um, heights and stories. So to achieve the 52 feet and four stories, there was a footnote C that required the upper um, story building step back. Um, it is replaced with subject to the amenity requirements of the new standards um, instead. Um, so it does eliminate the need for the upper story Great. building step back um, for these types of buildings to, to be able to accommodate that greater first floor height um, if the applicant wants to pursue that with, um, with a appropriate development above it as well. I, as I, I, think, I think that's not what Rachel was asking for if I understood it. If you went to the top of this page. Yeah, there Rachel was another was like, section. Can't, can't we fix the problem that it says third floor for outside the industrial district where it really should be fourth floor but I don't think we can do that in the scope of this article. No, we, it's actually, it's the amendment that we, we said we would update, Aaron. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, so I, I, and again, I think it was just, um, whether we fix it in this so that it's consistent with what we had said we were going to change earlier. Um, and Jean, I'm, I'm in favor as well of, finding an opportunity, as you suggested, to um, reduce the uh, residential ratio for larger parcels as well. So I like the one-to-one -one for larger parcels and two-to-one for the smaller parcels. Agreed. Okay, uh, any other questions for Aaron or comments before we open this up for public comment? Rachel? Ken, did I skip you? No, you. No, I went I'm first, sorry. but I do have a comment. Okay. <laughs> sorry, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Gene, you made an earlier comment about uh, solar ready on the roofs. Mm -hmm. uh, on, I agree totally with you on new roofs, but you said we should make that also apply for existing roofs. And is that, I, did I misheard you? I said if there was a substantial renovation of an existing building, not yeah. just an existing and, I, I, and I'm saying that that, that uh, may put an undue burden uh, on that and may eliminate it because the fact that um, you know what to make it uh, solar ready, you're adding 15 pounds of a uh, dead load onto an existing roof that may not be designed for it. And even though it is it's substantial, like they're changing, they're gutting the whole uh, thing, but leaving the structure there, you're not allowing them to do so because the structure can't hold up the added weight. So I was thinking, uh, would you be able to look, say, when applicable or when, uh, when, uh, uh, when, when feasible or something along those lines for existing? Sounds perfect to me. I accept that amendment. I, I just don't want to limit the board uh, and, and uh, put undue burden, you know? But that's only for the existing, the new. Only for existing, Gene. Right. I'm 100% on, on board with the, the new, but I still don't want to put too much of a burden on the existing. We're this... there. We're there, Ken. I agree with you. Okay. Thank you. I won't say nothing more. <laughs> um, Rachel, um, may, may I ask, um, you, uh, a number of the ARB members have had um, some comments relative to um, the amount of residential. Um, I was wondering if it would be appropriate to ask Eric to provide um, additional input. Um, we only heard from me, he might have something to add. Absolutely. And if he could just introduce himself again um, for the public who's listening, that would be fantastic. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Eric Halverson, Vice President and Principal with RKG Associates. We were the prime consultants uh, working with the town on the project. Um, I was actually going to raise my hand to see if I could get recognized really quick before they move to public comment just on that. I actually wanted to make sure that I understood Gene's point about the small versus the large parcels and 
it sounded like um, for the smaller parcels, the gene or the ARB, not to speak on behalf of the board, but would would want it, would be in favor of the two to one, but on the larger parcels be more in favor of the one to one. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, that's what I suggested, Aaron. Okay. So my only um, comment on that was we didn't do um, kind of a sensitivity analysis in the pro forma by parcel size. Um, what we did uh, was we took the four test fit parcels that Harriman had done the build out analysis on, which was one parcel for, or an agglomeration of parcels for each of the four industrial districts. The smallest parcel size that was tested as part of the test fit process. So the build out process was um, just shy of half an acre. It was about nine, a little over 19,000 square feet in size. Um, and that was in the, the Mystic um, area. Um, and we did test uh, the two scenarios we tested there. One was first floor manufacturing, second floor office. The other was a series of, I think, like residential townhomes that kind of went in a line. Um, all the, the other parcels were over two acres, the other three parcels that we tested. So we didn't test something. I just wanted to throw this out there. We didn't test something as small as 6,000 or 10,000 square feet. And I think if we were to go to something as small as 6,000, which I think Aaron might have mentioned at the beginning. The only concern I would have would be to, to do a test fit on that only because I wanna make sure if you go up three stories and you're including both either a commercial first floor office or industrial with residential above that you could actually park it and also get you know appropriate open space and, and be able to make the site work. Um, that's the only concern um, I think Eric, I would where, where would you Where would you set the, the break point for parcel size? based upon all the work you did? Um, without doing kind of a sensitivity mm -hmm. analysis around the, more on the test fit, I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable throwing out a number today, um, but I'm happy to talk more with you all or town staff on the side. I'll just say the smallest parcel we tested just from a test fit perspective um, was about 19,000 square feet. And, and you were able to get a, a building on there plus the plus surface parking and uh, um, the open space requirements and the setbacks according to the, the zoning. So at a parcel of that size, it, it did work. Um, I just don't know if we were to go say below 10,000 square feet, if it, if it would work or not. Yeah, I had suggested 10,000 as, as, the, as, the, as the demarcation. So 10,000 and less, you'd get two to one residential or industrial. More than 10,000, you'd get one to one. I don't know if it's possible for you to, I don't know, I can't authorize you to do anything, Eric, but if the staff <laughs> could authorize you to like do something to sort of see if you could come up with, um, you know, where the number would be. Yep. Yeah, we can, I'm not gonna speak on behalf of the staff, but I'm happy to talk offline uh, about that, Jenny and, and Aaron. Thank you yeah. so much. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Thank you Eric. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, uh, so with that, we will move to uh, public comment for Article 35. Uh, any member of the public wishing to comment or ask questions, please use the raise hand function in the participant section of Zoom. And I'll give you a minute or two. Oh. Okay, uh, the first speaker will be Don Seltzer. Well, I might as well get started since uh, no one else has raised their hand. Uh, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, a little bit of history. In 2019, town meeting appropriated funds to hire a consultant to recommend how we might invigorate our small industrial districts, bringing in new and emerging industries such as life sciences. And most importantly, I want to emphasize that this, bringing in good paying jobs that residents could walk or bike to. So we hired RKG and Harriman, and from December of 2019 through last May, they gave a series of reports to the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. There were interesting ideas presented, but they tend to be more about the kinds of density trade-offs that could be made to accommodate a sudden boom in growth with large office and research buildings going up, vertical farming, accompanied by amenities to the town such as microbreweries and fine restaurants. 
By May, it seemed that the work was nearly done and there was zero mention of mixed use residential. A small survey was sent out to residents over the summer, which included one question that showed that residential use of our industrial districts was at the very bottom of the list of desired uses. On October 19th, these findings and recommendations were presented before this board. At no time did any of the presenters mention the huge change that would make most of the report irrelevant. It was left to a few residents to ask about a tiny little footnote in the background materials. It was a small rewording that struck out the existing prohibition of residential and mixed use development, instead allowed it as an accessory use of less than 50% area. No explanation was provided at the meeting for this unmentioned change. The version is now before you has taken another unexplained quantum leap. Residential can now be the primary use, twice as large as any secondary use. It doesn't even have to be in the same building. It's not hard to imagine the kind of redevelopment that this will spur. Picture the Myrac or Gold's Gym sites dotted with apartment buildings built over or next to the very simplest type of token light industry that the developer could come up with. In other words, very few new jobs and no emerging industries such as the life sciences boom that is exploding on our doorstep in our life, Somerville, Watertown, and other neighboring communities. As it stands, this proposal with the residential included is ill-advised and will not generate the kind of growth that is needed in our industrial districts. One other thought that I wanna leave you with. The pro forma analyses that have been included in the study do not look at the benefits to the town they analyze the best rate of return for the landowners. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. The next, speak the next Hello. speaker will be Steve Revelak. Hello. Hello, Rachel. Rachel. I, I hear you and I will call on you in, in due turn. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Steve, Steve thank you. Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, I was a member of the zoning bylaw working group that worked on this proposal. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of myself this evening and not for the group as a whole. Um, just first, I just wanna remind everyone that our industrial districts are only about 1% of Arlington's land area. So they're small, that limits the amount of property tax revenue that the industrial district can generate. So. Our, the proposal before the board tonight will not turn these districts into big money makers, which is to say that we did not go down the route of allowing develop, development at the scale of, say, Kendall Square or Boston Seaport District. You know, we kept it smaller with the goal of, you know, attracting some newer and more contemporary uses, and perhaps with the ability to add some additional jobs and some, you know, amenities to pedestrians and so forth. Uh, one part I really like about the proposal is the performance standards in exchange for a height, a height bonus. I think that's a good way for a community to state what it's looking for. And I think the bonus structure increases the chance of, you know, you actually getting what you want. So after developing this list of performance standards, we asked the consultants to put together a few performance pro formers. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that the standards weren't going to, um, you know, be prohibitively expensive. And this is where it sort of came to light that, well, if you, without resident, a residential component, some of these, it's just not worth redeveloping. It's not financially viable to redevelop them. But if you allow a certain amount of residential, uh, then it would become financially viable. I mean, our land is expensive and this is true even in the industrial district. So I'm personally fine with residential, but you know, among the working group, I do have to acknowledge that there was not unanimous agreement on that point. Um, so I hope you'll consider moving this forward, but um, you know, the worst thing that could happen possibly is things stay as they are and we'll just um, you know, circle, back, circle back in a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Chris Loretti. I, I do see you, John Morden, and I, I will call on you. You're, you'll be this, uh, two more speakers and then I'll, you'll be able to speak. Thank you. Uh, Chris Loretti. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, Adam Street. I'm going to go through some more um, specific comments and then uh, end with some more uh, general thoughts on this. Um, I, I don't like the um, things related to reducing or allowing the greater height um, for the reasons in part that Mr. Benson stated. And I think if you're going to provide guidance in the bylaw about um, things that fall within the height buffer district or areas where you're going to allow greater height, it should be consistent across the zoning districts and it shouldn't be specific to one zone or another, in this case, the um, industrial zone. Um, I find the standards ambiguous because it says it has to meet these standards. It doesn't say whether it has to meet any one of them or all of them. Under 5.6.2a, I don't think you need to grant that exemption for renewable energy because there's already an exemption in the bylaw under 5.3.20a for things like that that are on the roof. Um, I don't think you should be re limiting the fences to 5.6.2 and 5.6.2.82 to four feet. If I'm going down the bike path, I really don't think I need to look into the backyard of a um, auto body shop and see a bunch of dented cars. Um, and then I also find very confusing the description of mixed use buildings in the industrial districts under 5.9.2i. In one case, it says the ground floor has to be industrial or commercial, and then it says it has to be light industrial, but commercial is not light industrial. Um, and I, I'm unclear, you have expanded the list of light industrial, I think it's expansion, into what I call sort of the gentrified or fashionable light industrial uses. I don't know if that's to replace the existing traditional light industrial uses or to add to them. And the, the traditional ones are like auto body, um, commercial laundry, truck repair, stone cutting, and, and things like that. Um, and I want to tell you how I would game this if I lived in, or if I owned property in the industrial district, because I think um, allowing residential there is a great way of destroying the industrial district. As a previous speaker said, it only constitutes about 1% of the land area in town. If people want to have local businesses to repair their car, to do landscaping, to serve in the building trades, you should not be allowing any residential in the industrial district. Um, what I would do if I owned a machine shop there is I would put, say, a 3,000 square foot machine shop on a 9,000 square foot lot. I'd put a second floor condo on, and then I would build a separate house in a separate building. And, you know, then so that the residential takes up two thirds of that buildable um, potential for that lot. You will never see any more industrial use. You'll never see any more commercial use on that lot after that. It's gone. And I also uh, take great exception to allowing, giving a special treatment to artists. In, in other cities and towns where that's Thank been you. done, Thank the you. industrial district is dying. You don't have enough land in the industrial the district to support the current demand Barbara for the Thornton. existing use. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to be uh, brief I, and uh, send in writing. I'm just tremendously excited about this possibility. I think it adds to the fabric of life in Arlington. It brings us into what I would like to see is a more diverse uh, community with places to walk to, places to live, places to view that are interesting and uh, exciting. I, I am a big fan of keeping artists in Arlington. I think it contributes to the life and the diversity of this town. And I think this is a step forward to physically be able to make our town more vibrant and more an interesting place. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be John Warden. Yeah, it's okay now. All right. I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, I, the reason I didn't do the raised hand thing is because there's no raised hand icon or possibility on the display that's on my computer. Okay, well, we, we were able to, to hear you, so I appreciate it. If you could uh, just state your name and address uh, for okay. the record, we'll, we'll go ahead and start your time. 
Uh, John Worden, page 27, Jason Street. Thank you. Uh, I'm also a member, not only a town meeting member, but a member of the zoning bylaw working group. And at each meeting of that uh, group, uh, when this industrial study came up, I pointed out that basically the appropriation for the consultants was sold to town meeting on the basis that we were doing an industrial study that we were working on the commercial uh, and uh, industrial um, uh, uses in, in this tiny percentage of the town and, and that residential was not part of the equation. And, and as I've quoted several times to the working group and to your board, um, uh, Mr. Tosti spoke very eloquently on the subject and was very adamant that there was no residential should not be included. I would accept the 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 artist work uh, work sleep space or whatever you call it. I think that, that that's all right. But the general uh, turning it into a residential area is, is absolutely bad. It's bad enough that Myrak has put a big 40B in the middle of his uh, of the largest section of industrial zoning, or he's about to put it. Um, but the the um, You've got you've got 99 or you've got a very large percentage of the town, at least 95% that is already zoned for residential. There are plenty of other places to put it. Putting it here is, as Mr. Loretti said, this will destroy the industrial district. And I'm afraid, you know, if, if someone disagreed, if someone on this board or someone in the planning department disagreed with the, what Mr. Tosti, the argument Mr. Tosti used to sell this appropriation to town meeting. They had a moral obligation to stand up and say, wait a minute, Mr. Tosti, we are not going to limit uh, the, the, this, the, the products of this study to just uh, non-residential uses. We're going to do, we, we, we're going to do other things. And, and, and nobody did that. They let that sale by. And a lot of us who are going to vote against that appropriation voted for it on the basis that the board and the planning department accepted what Tosti was saying is the purposes of the study. And I'm afraid, I, I think the, the redevelopment board puts itself in a very poor, poor position with respect to the town, if they're gonna say in words or impliedly, uh, one thing to town meeting members to get their vote, the vote they want and do another thing when, when, when the products come down the road. And I look at, at mixed use as, as a classic example of a bait and switch. So I hope you will not do this in this case. Uh, that, that either this should be sent back for further study, or you should remove all the the industrial, uh, all the residential uses. The initial draft of the proposed bylaw amendments said mixed use paren, no residential, and then somehow that disappeared, and there was a claim over there was something in a footnote or blah 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 blah. Next thing, it's basically you're turning it into a, a residential area with maybe a few shops on the ground floor. Thank That's you. Your, thank you. Your time. Uh, the next speaker will be Kristen Anderson. All right, uh, Kristen Anderson, 12 Upland Road West. Um, I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 13 and I run a business at 60 Lowell Street <clears throat> which is um, one of the buildings in the 30 Park Ave uh, Gold's Gym lot. Um, and we are doing um, warehousing and distribution there. Um, we get along very well with um, our residential neighbors and our commercial neighbors. And I am speaking tonight in opposition to changing um, uh, the zoning um, definition of industrial to include residential use. Um, I don't think that you're going to have, um, you're going to be encouraging businesses to stay in Arlington um, if you allow for residential use in the small amount of industrial space that we have in Arlington. Um, our business uh, used to be located in Malden and before that it was located in Somerville, just a mile outside of Davis Square. <clears throat> and um, 
we really love being in Arlington. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that is about all that I have to say um, about that. In terms of um, some points that have been made about um, allowing for um, artists live, live in space, um, I'm generally in favor of that. I, uh, for 10 years, I lived in Sullivan Square in um, a commercial uh, artist loft space. Um, and uh, where half of the building um, was occupied by artists um, who lived there 24-7. Um, however, it, I find it very difficult to believe that um, artists will be able to afford um, rents in Arlington. Um, all of the artists that I know um, have moved um, out of the greater Boston area because of the cost um, uh, of industrial space and also um, the declining amount of it. Um, many moved to Providence at one point um, and there seems to be um, a movement towards cities like Detroit for artists because it is very affordable to live there. Um, so while it sounds really nice um, to be encouraging artists live in space, I think it's completely unrealistic and um, I'm not sure uh, how you can encourage that really, especially when you're talking about um, using uh, uh, mixed use residential use um, in order to get developers um, to want to develop these parcels um, to make it more um, uh, financially viable for them. Thank you. You're um, at time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, do we have any other uh, members of the public? It looks like uh, Arm Holman just raised his hand. Arm. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, uh, fine. Give me one, give me one second, please. I'm sorry. No. Uh, okay. Um, my name is Aram Holman, 12 Whittemore Street. I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Aram Holman, 12 Whittemore Street. Uh, I want to note a comment uh, on the DPCD report uh, that uh, resonated uh, with me. Due to low turnover, there has been limited recruitment for industrial use since 2016. I am paraphrasing. That's not an exact quote. Let me translate the bureaucraties. We haven't bothered to try. That's Arlington's attempt at getting more business. I believe that Arlington needs to maintain its 5% of a commercial industrial tax base, not further diluted with more housing. I think the last 20 plus years have shown that building more housing in Arlington has for the most part, neither improved municipal finances as the budget continues to rise year after year at three to 4%. And similarly, with the exception of a few truly affordable housing units built by nonprofits, housing construction has been mostly not just market rate, but top of the market rate, and that includes 40 Bs. To that end, and relevant here, Arlington should not be mixing more in residential in with industrial. As we can see with 1165 R Mass Ave, this is the residential camel sticking its nose in the industrial tent. Arlington's industrial property owners have been waiting for decades to do this, to cash in, and except for owner occupiers, have let their properties deteriorate, deteriorate through a kind of benign neglect. Their properties are perfectly leasable or sellable, as is under current zoning without changing. The owners are not interested in selling under these terms because they want more. 
nor is the town interested in preserving these properties as is. On the contrary, both are hoping to cash in on more housing. Now, it may be in these property owners' best interest to allow this. It is not in the town of Arlington's. And Arlington town government needs to act on behalf of the entire town, not just a few property owners. Arlington needs more jobs, more than it needs more housing. And the housing that it does need needs to be affordable housing, not more market rate. This proposal will neither help bring more jobs nor more affordable housing to Arlington. On the contrary, the creation of market rate housing in the industrial area will make industrial uses even less economically competitive in a self-perpetuating cycle, the end of which will be that Arlington is entirely a bedroom community. A comment was made earlier that Arlington's industrial district comprised 1% of its land area. That may be so, but even in this minimally valued state, it pays roughly 5% of Arlington's tax base. In other words, it is economic. One quick comment and then I will stop, thank you. Uh, it pays roughly 5% of the tax and that's without a split tax rate. Great, we thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker will be Susan Stamps. Hi everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. So- um, I, I'm sorry, could you just state your first last name and yeah. address for the record? My name is Susan Stamps and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 3 and I am a member of the tree committee um, and speaking for myself and not the tree committee because we have not discussed any of these warrant articles. Um, I, and I, I will confess that I have not studied these warrant articles. I want to just preface my brief remarks, which I just thought of, I wasn't going to speak, um, with um, as a town meeting member for the last several years, we've gone through many cycles of having zoning uh, bylaw changes come before the meeting. And I have expressed frustration, and many of us have, uh, many times with the fact that um, it's, it's very hard to understand what the changes are, um, especially for those of us who, are, who learn visually and I, have, I personally have asked many times over the course of several years, if we could please be given the information in, you know, in verbal is, you know, and written is obviously got to do that, but um, and be able to, for example, for this um, bylaw um, change to show under the current um, code what a development might look like or what you know an industrial development might look like and what it might look like the same one might look like or several examples of what it might look like under the revised code i really think that if you give people the opportunity to see what you guys are spending a lot of your valuable time doing um that people would have greater appreciation because they would understand it. And I think that it would make for a better process for the town. So I just wanted to say that and say it again. Um, and, but I, uh, the, the, the town has recently undergone several um, planning projects which have addressed um, the heat island effect in town, um, the way is to, um, to reduce the heat, um, increase trees to, for carbon capture, and generally address the issue of climate change. We have a net zero plan that we just produced. There's the municipal vulnerability plan that came out recently. The town is a member of the Mystic um, Resiliency Coalition or whatever it's called, 20 of the 21 towns in the, in the Mystic River watershed. And um, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing in this bylaw, which I've been seeing in others too, is that there's an opportunity here to do things, to require things, based on the new paradigm of having to do everything we can um, to address future flooding, which is going to happen, um, worse heat islands, which will happen, um, worse uh, carbon pollution, which will happen. So, for example, in um, 
um, number five, the, where pedestrian amenities and new development or additions over 50% shall provide the following, either one of the following. Um, that's number five. I don't have a, the previous page, so I, I hope you know what I'm talking about. It says a shade tree every 35 feet or planter boxes every 15 linear feet. Now, I love planter boxes as much as anyone else, but a shade tree provides a lot more benefit for the environment. And so I would like to see you require a shade tree every 35 feet and encourage the planter boxes, um, but not, you know, have it be either or. So that's, that's the so first. You're, you're, at, you're at time. Um, I, I would love to have though the, um, Aaron, uh, just respond to your, to your question and request regarding um, visuals. Uh, I know that that was sure. a part of the um, initial presentation of the um, industrial zoning bylaws uh, working group to, um, to, the, uh, to the redevelopment board uh, several meetings ago. So Aaron, if you could just address some of the visuals and the ways that, um, that the, uh, the, the RKG and the, um, the planning group took a, took a look at this, that would be great. Sure, um, so I'm Aaron Swerko, I'm the assistant director. Um, throughout uh, the process, we um, completed um, fit up scenarios. Harriman provided fit up scenarios, which are um, boxy sort of massing structures, which um, is not fantastic, but it gives a sense of what could be allowed under existing zoning and what could be allowed under the future zoning. In addition to the memo that is provided here um, with this agenda, we also provided um, a, a diagram to explain um, how the uses could be uh, uh, shown on the site. Um, so while we didn't get into detailed drawings of before and after the, the process th through the entire um, project did provide um, descriptions and drawings that showed uh, visually what we were talking about in narrative format. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Erin. And um, I, I think if this does go forward to town meeting, we will um, definitely incorporate some of those visuals into any presentation um, that goes forward. Uh, so the, uh, Don Salter, I see that you have your hand raised again. Do you have a new or different point or question to ask? Yes, I do, Madam Chair. Okay. And I would appreciate this second opportunity to speak. I thank you for yep. that. Don Seltzer Irving Street. I just have a short remark to make to the ideas that Jean Benson presented regarding um, dividing into large and small lots for certain rules. Um, I think it has potential, but you do have to protect against the possibility of a large landowner subdividing down into 10 or 20,000 square foot lots to take advantage of better rules for smaller lots. And in fact, you'll find that if you look at some of the larger parcels, such as owned by the Myrax, they really are actually already um, a mixture of contiguous lots of various sizes that comprise um, the larger parcel. So ju just be careful of putting safeguards in for that situation. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Chris Loretti with your hand raised to speak again. Again, do you have a new or different point to, to make from your previous? I do, Madam Chair, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Chris Loretti, Adam Street still. I just wanted to clarify a couple things, um, some of the background information in the memo you received from staff. Um, there was a statement in there that one and two family homes are allowed by right in the zoning district. I don't believe that's correct at all. Um, and if it were correct, you would have, you'd be seeing a lot more of them being built in the industrial district where there are one and two family homes there now, as with, um, you know, larger apartment buildings in the district, they're all pre-existing non-conforming uses. And um, the only exception or the only new construction of residences in the industrial district have been 40B projects. So, um, you know, there was a conscious decision back in the 70s when the zoning bylaw changed to concentrate some of the more um, industrial or less desirable uses in like the Dudley Street district. 
And so over time, you've seen more automotive uses there, and in some cases, replacing the residential uses that were previously there. So I just want to want to point that out that the that the current residential use in the in the industrial district is really an anomaly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, we will uh, close public comment for Article 35. Um, any other points of discussion for the board before we uh, move on to uh, our next article? Ken, Jean, Melissa, David. Okay. So we will now move on to Article 36, uh, which is a zoning bylaw amendment, um, uh, an update to the zoning map uh, with the new date of November 16th, 2020. And Erin, I will turn this back over to you. Sure thing. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so in as uh, the screen shows at the November 2020 special town meeting, um, there was a zoning change that was adopted um, to rezone a portion of the DPW yard from R1 to industrial. Um, we noticed post um, that that we should update the date um, in section 4.2. So this uh, this zoning article makes that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Uh, we'll move on to questions or comments from the board, starting with Ken. No, I have no questions. The, the zoning map does not change. All we're doing is changing the date. Great, thank you. Uh, then uh, move on to David. No questions. Jean? Yeah, it seems fine to me. No questions. Melissa? No questions. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, we will move to public comment. And uh, Susan Stamps, I saw your hand go up right at the end after I closed for the previous. So if you have any items, I'd be happy to take your comment now, or if any other member of the public uh, wishing to speak, would like to speak on Article 36, please use the raise hand function. And I'm just gonna cycle through making sure- John, John Warden is waving. I'm just looking for people waving at me. Okay, John Warden, go ahead. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Thanks, thanks. I'm sure. John Worden, Bill J 27 Jade Street. Um, uh, just two, two things about the map. Actually, the map will change because of the, the, um, the uh, switch of the, uh, the soccer practice field at the high school to uh, industrial uses so, you could, so DPW people could park their cars there or something. So that is a change in the map. But what I, the, the change I really wanted to, to uh, to ask about uh, what goes to uh, uh, the, sorry, uh, it goes to the, the presentation of the map itself. Uh, and I'm folding out the map and uh, I'm sure you all have this memorized and you know what it's like. But the, um, the problem is that we have a large number of small zones. It's a real patchwork quilt, as you know. And it's awfully hard to make them out. A lot of the streets aren't identified. And sometimes it's very difficult to figure out where a zone begins or ends. And what I'm suggesting is that the, the, uh, the, 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 the index of streets across the top in microtype, that could be put on a separate page. And then the map itself could be maybe 30% uh, bigger and would make it more useful, uh, not only to the public, but to uh, property owners and, 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 to, and the planning department and you folks. Is the, the list of zoning down the side, I guess that's important to have that. But but I think if the if the map were bigger, the map used the old maps used to be bigger. And I don't know where they kept the street index, but they, they didn't use it to, to take up 25% of the, the, the size of the map. So I just suggest make that suggestion that for, for the benefit of all you 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 put it in a, in a larger and more readable format. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments on the uh, change of the date of the zoning map? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will close uh, public comments on 
I don't, uh, uh, Article 36. Uh, are there any other comments or questions from the uh, from the board on Article 36? Okay. Um, with that, we will close uh, public comment for the uh, for the uh, public hearings for the annual town meeting, and uh, we will now move into. Um, a review of each of the individual articles. Um, and uh, we'll go through those one by one. And uh, the redevelopment board will vote on whether to recommend action or no action on each of the articles. Jean, I see, did you have your hand up? Yeah, actually, if uh, if I might, Rachel, um, we we actually need to accept comments for all all of the articles just to check to see if there's comments on oh, any sure. of the articles Absolutely. that have been heard before you close the public comment. I'm guessing that's what Jean was going to say <laughs> since we talked earlier. Sure. Um, so yeah, we need to do that, then close public comment, then you can deliberate. I was going to actually pull up the document with all of the all of the articles in it. So okay, thanks, Jenny. Okay. Thank you. Great. So uh, we'll have one last call for any public comments on any of the uh, articles that have been presented uh, before we close the public hearing. So we'll start with uh, Eric. Hello, thank you. I appreciate your patience. I'd like to make a comment on the I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. If you could just identify first, last name, and address. Certainly. Thank Eric, you. Eric Pohl, 285 Massachusetts Avenue, um, Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, um, I'm reading uh, as part of the public comment and part of the record uh, uh, a letter in tied with the subject affordable housing letter for the uh, um, one article Laura Kiesel was a proponent of last meeting um, regarding inclusionary zoning. Um, the, the email goes, hello, I hope you're doing well. I want to submit a letter on behalf of the Boston Center for Independent Living in support of the warrant that would amend section 8.2.3a of the zoning bylaw to increase the percentage of affordable housing units required in any development subject to section 8.2 the zoning bylaw from 15% to 25% or take any action related thereto. Would you be able to attach it to tonight's agenda? My apologies for the late notice. Thank you so much, Shia French. And that is um, once again, uh, uh, approval or um, exhortation by the um, Boston Center for Independent Living to support that Warren article. Uh, proponent Laura Kiesel discussed last time regarding um, percentage of affordable housing units. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, comments from uh, the public before we uh, close public comment on the public hearings? Okay, uh, seeing none, I will ask for a motion from the board to uh, close public comment for the public hearings for 2021 zoning work articles for town meeting. So motioned. Do we have a second? Second. I'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Uh, I got a, a physical yes there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm a yes as well. Okay, so now we will move into uh, the deliberation for each of the articles. And Jenny, I think it would probably be easiest if we took these just in numerical order, if that works for you. So we will start with Article 28, which is the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for uh, Affordable Housing Requirements. And I will open this up for um, for each one of these, I will open them up for comment from uh, the board members, and we'll start with uh, Ken on this one. 
Um, I have no real comment. All I'm, uh, I do want to say that as written, I do not support this. So this is the, uh, this is the zoning bylaw amendment to um, increase the uh, affordable housing requirements from a two to a three year period. Um, that was, this is the administrative change. Yeah, this, this is, is the this, this is, is the administrative percent. change filed by the board. Sorry, Rachel. Oh, it is. Yes. Oh, I, I apologize. I thought it was the right. There are, there are the two percent. that are that are similar, right? This one is in, in terms of their name, but this is very different in its um, in its scope. So this was this was the administrative change uh, to go from two to three years, the extension of the term of the special permit. I'm fine with that one there. Okay, Jean. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it too. It just lets the um, bylaw catch up to what uh, the state law is. Great, thanks. Uh, David? Yep, I, I agree. I'm fine with it. Okay, Melissa? Yes, fine with it. And I am as well. So uh, we will go ahead and um, see if we have a, a motion to um, motion to uh, recommend action on uh, Article 28, the zoning bylaw amendment uh, related to affordable housing requirements. So motioned. Do we have a second? Second. And I'll take a roll call vote. This again is to recommend action. We'll start with uh, Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. David. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I am a yes as well. Just a clarification, is that favorable action? Is that what we're Favorable saying? action, yes. yes. I, I'll, I will say no action. Yes, a favorable for, action. for no. If I just say recommend action, it will be favorable. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the next article is article 29 which is the zoning bylaw amendment for apartment conversion, which was inserted by the request of the board. Um, this is again, an administrative change uh, for the uh, update to the uh, use listed in the table of uses. So I'll go through again for any questions or comments, starting with Ken. I have no questions. Jean. Are we voting on the article or also on the actual little amendment here too? You're, you're voting, yeah, you need to vote on to move to recommend action, but on the way that it's amendment amended here. So that right. is to add a definition, by the way. Um, and this is what I've highlighted here. Okay, thank you. Um, go to go to the other members of the board. I okay. need to think about this sentence. Okay, David. Um, I, I don't think I have a question, but now that Gene's hesitating, I'm wondering if his hesitation has to do with duplexes. Well, we'll get back to, to Gene's question. We won't speculate, we'll let him <laughs> tell us what his hesitation is. Uh, so we'll go to Melissa, any questions or comments? No questions. All right, Gene, back to you. Yeah, so let me ask the staff about whether this would be better to just says the conversion of a single family, two family or duplex dwelling to an apartment building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, without the conversion of an additional existing structure originally designed for. Because some of these things might've been designed for something else a long time ago or redesigned. So I was just thinking this would just say the conversion of a single family, two family or duplex dwelling um, to an apartment building with no addition to or expansion of the interior of the structure. I'm just wondering what the staff thinks about that as opposed to this wording that's here. Jenny? Um, actually, Aaron, did, was there a reason for existing structure originally designed for? Because I feel that came from some original discussion yep. uh, um, that we had about this. Yeah, so it, um, 
the single and two family uses are um, that phrase is used elsewhere in the bylaw when referring to apartment conversion. So I didn't want to depart from that phrase that is used elsewhere. And to be clear, it's the building is not converting to an apartment building, um, which is a, is a use in our um, zoning bylaw. It's an apartment conversion, which is a, is a use as well with its own dimensional and density requirements that are different than an apartment building. Um, so, I, so I would be hesitant to uh, first include any reference to apartment building, um, but then to stray from some, the language that's used around apartment conversion elsewhere in the bylaw. But how about the conversion of an existing structure originally designed? Couldn't it say the conversion of a structure used for one family or two family use to an apartment building? Why is the existing structure originally designed for in this? I, again, that phrase comes from um, the description of apartment conversion. It's lifted from the description, I believe, of the R4. Um, uh, but uh, to my ears, your edit does not um, sound like it would materially change that description. Jean, do you want a second to look that up? Um, yeah, I was trying to find the R4 definition. I'm sorry, I should have done this before. Oh, I apologize. No problem. Um, I have it, Jean, if, if it would be helpful for me to read it yes. off. Okay. Great. Thank you so yep. much. Um, so, R4, so this is section 541B2. R4 townhouse districts, the predominant use in the R4 district are one and two family dwellings in large older houses. Conversions of these old homes to apartments or offices are permitted, um, uh, excuse me, are allowed to encourage the preservation. Um, and then it also is um, in the, the, uh, the B1 district, which says in the neighborhood office district, the predominant uses include one and two family dwellings, houses with offices on the ground floor um, or office structures, which are um, in keeping with the scale of the um, adjacent houses. Um, so that's where I took some of the discussion. Um, but again, your proposed edit does not sound um, to be uh, uh, change the actual materiality of the amendment. What is your objection to an existing structure I, I just, originally designed for it, that it's too specific? It's too specific and there may be some really old structures in town that were, that would be subject to this, but might've been designed or something else and at some point along the way it got converted. So I think it would be better to say the conversion of an existing structure used for one or two family use to an apartment building. I have no issue with that. So that's to uh, change originally designed to used. So it's say the conversion of an existing structure used for, right. If that's okay with the staff, if they think not, I, I'm okay. I think as Aaron was saying, we were just trying to be consistent with other other references in the bylaw. This is also only um, R four and R five and B one. Um, but I, I don't the, I don't have a very I don't have a strong reaction to your to your edit. So I, well, I don't think any of those Aaron mentioned used the term an existing structure originally designed for. So I suggest changing it used for. I agree. I didn't hear any reference to originally designed. So I, I would approve this with that amendment. So moved. Okay. Is there a second to uh, recommend favor favorable action as uh, amended by Jean? Second by Ken? Second. 
Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? David? He's on mute. Oh, sorry, I can't see him on my screen. David, if you could oh, unmute. Sorry. Um, there, I just did a search and there is a reference to using oh. that exact language in the table. Oh. And it Thank says you, in an existing building originally designed for single or two family residential use. So let's go back to the previous one. I withdraw my amendment then. Okay. So is there a motion to uh, vote for favorable action uh, for uh, the for Article Twenty Nine as submitted, I move for that as submitted. Okay, second. Second. I'll second it. Great, uh, Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. David. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Right. Moving on to uh, Article Thirty. This is uh, the zoning bylaw amendment relative to gross floor area, um, clarifying how landscaped and usable floor open space is calculated, so, uh, inserted at the request of the redevelopment board as well. Uh, and Jean, I will start with you for any questions. No, I think it's fine. We actually got some suggestions from the public to do this also, and I think it's a necessary clarification. Great. David? I, I hate to do this, but I think I was an error on the last one. It's It has that language in one part of the table related to some uses. Uh, conversion of, of some uses, but when it's strictly residential, it does not say originally designed for. Okay. Can we finish uh, this article one so, first? Yeah, so uh, let's let's finish article 30 and then we'll go back to article 29. If, if uh, yeah, I do not have any, any further questions or comments on that one. Okay. Uh, Melissa, any questions on Article 30? No. Ken? No. Nope. Okay. So is there a motion to approve Article 30 as uh, approve action, favorable action on Article 30? So motion. Is there a second? Second. I will take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that moves forward, uh, recommended for favorable action. Uh, we'll go back to Article 29. Like uh, to so just to more? just to explain what I'm seeing in uh, Section 5.4.3 in the use table. In the first section under residential, it references conversion to apartments up to 18 units per acre with no alteration to the exterior of the building. Later in the table um, under um, office uses, it says uh, business professional or medical clinic offices in an existing building originally designed for single or two family residential use. Uh, so I think that's that's the section that language came from, but it does not specifically apply to the residential section of the table. The residential use section. I'd say we took a vote already. And I have no not... problem with it as written. Yeah, that's fine. I, I don't either, but okay. I, I just wanted to clarify because I, I wasn't quite that, correct. <laughs> okay, so with that, let's move on to uh, Article 31, which is uh, another uh, administrative change, the zoning bylaw amendment uh, relative to prohibited uses, which was also inserted at the request of the redevelopment board. Uh, this is clarifying uh, those designated with a Y or an SP. Any questions or comments, starting with Ken? No. 
Gene? No, again, this is a clarification that makes sense. And I think it was also suggested to us by members of the public. Great, David? No comments. Melissa? No comment. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, recommend favorable action for Article 31 as submitted? No motion. One of you want to make that a second? Go ahead, second. Se Jean has a second. Okay. Uh, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Recommend favorable action on Article 31. Article 32 is the zoning bylaw amendment um, related to uh, other districts' dimensional and density regulations. Uh, this is a um, amendment relative to, I think, adding the, ele the legend for the tables. We'll start with any questions from Ken. None. Jean? Looks good. David? No questions. Melissa? No questions. Is there a motion to uh, recommend favorable action as submitted? So moved. Second. All right, uh, take a vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. All right, moving on to Article 33. This is the uh, zoning bylaw amendment. This is uh, multiple administrative amendments inserted at the request of the redevelopment board. Uh, I'll start with any questions from Ken. None. Jean? None. David? No questions. Melissa? No questions. Great, we will take a, uh, do I have a, a motion to recommend favorable action for article 33 as submitted? So move. Second. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. That moves forward with favorable action. We'll now go to Article 34. Which is uh, a zoning bylaw amendment relative to um, marijuana uses for marijuana delivery only retailers, which was inserted at the request of the redevelopment board. Any questions starting with Ken? No. Jean? No. David? Uh, no questions. Just wanted to note that this was necessary for compliance with uh, new regulations from the state. Yep. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, Melissa? No comment. Okay. Is there a, a motion to uh, recommend favorable action for Article 34 as submitted? So motion. Second. Second. All right. Uh, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. The next, sorry, let me get on. Okay, we are next uh, with Article 36. Excuse me one second while I let up. All right, so we now go to Article 35, which is the zoning bylaw amendment relative to industrial uses that we just um, heard this evening. Uh, so we'll start with any uh, discussion points, starting with uh, Ken. That's going to include what we talked about today in Gene's suggestion, right? Well, that's what we should talk about tonight. Yes. No, I have no questions. I'm, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure what we do about this at this point because we want to see, or we suggested some amendments to this. So I'm not sure how we can vote for it without seeing the amendments. Maybe Jenny has a way for us to do that. Jean, were, were you hoping to see some additional analysis uh, with respect to uh, the what the size cutoff might be? Well, I had suggested 10,000, and then there was the idea that maybe there would be a quick analysis done to see if that was the right cutoff. Well, there certainly, that, that would not allow us to move forward with that, um, Gene, if you wanted to see any analysis. Well, and even if I didn't, this would need to be slightly redone to create that um, rule that less, you know, 10,000 square feet or less, there'd be a, a two to one residential for industrial and more than 10,000, there'd be a one to one max. Plus I had suggested some other um, changes and I liked um, Susan Stamp's idea about making the trees mandatory and the planter boxes optional. So I don't know what to do with that because there do need to be some things added to this. Can can we vote on it when we meet on Thursday? Not really. Uh, so to, to basically tomorrow morning, we ha I have to finalize the draft report to town meeting, post it for the meeting on Thursday night when you have to vote for that report. So it'd be challenging to put this to the side. Um, and also, while I appreciate the desire for further analysis, we will not be able to do that in the timeline that we've got going on here. Uh, it is not conceivable to have that happen. Um, I'm glad to consult with uh, RKG and staff about this and provide some answers in the coming weeks, but um, and perhaps at town meeting if needed. But I'm, I'm, I'm unable to do that in the timeline that we have right now. Um, I would suggest that if you have if you feel strongly about any of the edits, you suggest them now um, and we live edit while we're here. If you want to, one other suggestion could be, Rachel, that you take this out of order. And if you want to, you know, wait, come back to it and move on to other things. We do have petitioners here tonight. Um, so that might be another way to handle this. Come back to the board issues. Um, just a suggestion. Yeah, maybe we can do it last. Uh, I'm fine with that. If uh, if the other board members agree with uh, pushing this one, we can certainly come come back to this one at the at the end. That's fine with me. I'm okay with that. Any objections? Okay, let's go ahead and move on to Article 36, and I will put this one to the side. So Article 36 is a the zoning bylaw amendment for the zoning map adoption that was uh, changed during town meeting last year, which was inserted by the request of the redevelopment board. Any uh, questions or comments, starting with Ken? No. Jean? Can Jenny just explain why we're doing this at this point? In November town meeting, you moved to, and it was adopted to change that parcel from the uh, residentially zoned R1 to industrial to allow the, DP, the DPW campus to expand um, with uses that are not allowed in R1. So you made, a, you, you made a change, but that change had an impact on the map. So now we need to change the map um, date that is in the bylaw because it was actually changed. We didn't do that. So that is what's needed at this time. The date in the bylaw is May 19th, 2015, which was the date that corresponds with the master plan endorsement by town meeting. So it's an administrative change. Okay, so we're not readopting the zoning map, which is what article 36 says. We're just changing the date. It just says to update the date, actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. David, any questions? No. No. Melissa. <clears throat> Think that is a no. Nope. No. Okay. Uh, so, is there a motion to uh, recommend favorable action for Article Thirty Six as uh, submitted? So no motion. 
I'll second. Great. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So Article 6, six moves forward with recommended action. Next is Article 37, which is uh, the zoning bylaw amendment for multifamily zoning for MBTA communities, which we had previously discussed, um, recommending no action given the lack of uh, guidance that so far we've been given by the state uh, for this new requirement. Uh, any discussion on this article, starting with Ken? Jean? No. David? No. Melissa? No. Nope. Great. Is there a motion to recommend no action for Article 37? So moved. Second. And we'll take a vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So this has recommended no action for Article 37. Okay. Uh, the next is Article 38, which is the zoning bylaw amendment for energy efficient homes on non conforming lots that was inserted at the request of the redevelopment board. Um, any discussion, starting with Ken? No. Jean? No. David? No. Melissa? No. Uh, is there a motion to recommend action, favorable action for Article 38 as submitted? Yes, so moved. Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that's favorable action for Article 38. Next up is Article 39, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for the clarification of the definition of mixed use inserted at the request of Chris Loretti. We'll start with discussion, starting with uh, Ken. No. Uh, Jean, any discussion? Uh, I would I would just say that um, I think the zoning bylaw is very clear on this. It doesn't need any clarification at all. And what this would do is reduce the ability to have good projects in some places in town. David? Uh, no discussion. Uh, Melissa? No. No further comment. Great, and Jean, I agree with you. Is there a, a motion to recommend no action for Article Thirty Nine? Yes. So, so, so. Uh, yes. Second. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. David. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I am a yes as well. So Article 39 received a vote of no action. Next is Article 40, which is a, a zoning bylaw amendment for the conversion of commercial to residential inserted by uh, John Warden. So any uh, discussion, starting with Jean. Um. I just think this is going to result in no new affordable housing, but will prevent some small places from being renovated and rehabilitated. So I, I don't think it's a good idea. Ken? I agree with Jean. David? I also agree with Jean. Melissa? Yes, no further comment on this. I agree as well. Is there a motion to recommend no action for Article 40? So motioned. Second. Second. Take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. David. 
Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that's no action on Article 40. We'll move to Article 41, which is the zoning bylaw amendment for the definition of a foundation inserted uh, by Patricia Warden. And we'll start with uh, Ken. Uh, no, I, I disagree with this one here. I think this is just adding more confusion. So um, I, I don't support this. Jean? I think the staff discussion gets it exactly right. No other comment. David? Uh, I have no further discussion on this. Melissa? No further discussion. Okay, is there a motion to recommend uh, no action for Article 41? So a motion. Second. We'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Let me guess as well. So that's no action for Article 41. Next is Article 42, a zoning bylaw amendment for affordable housing on privately owned parcels of non conforming size. Uh, inserted by Barbara Thornton. She actually um, requested removal of this. So we would just need to formally take a vote of no action. Um, so is there a motion to uh, recommend no action for this, for Article 42? I'll move. Second. Take a vote. Uh, Kim? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So that's no action on 42. The next is Article 43, which is a amendment to uh, propose the adoption of accessory dwelling units. Uh, we'll start discussion with Ken. No question. Jean? Um, yeah, I think this is a good article. I was just reading it this afternoon and I, I saw something in it. So if you can pass me by for a second, let me see if I can find it again. Sure, we'll come back to you. David? Uh, I, I have no further comments on this. I think it's a good article. Um, there have been some changes made in response to comments from the board as well as members of the public. And I think uh, uh, with those changes incorporated as, as submitted, uh, it's acceptable. Thank you, Melissa. Um, yes, I support this going forward. I feel like they have done their research and collaborated with staff on this, so thank you. Yeah, I agree with what others said. I really have nothing to add. I think it was a, a good uh, collaborative process and the project proponents did their homework very well. Great. And I also want to applaud them for being so um, responsive to the comments from the members of the public board and the and the staff as well. So is there a Rachel, motion? To, sorry, yes, Rachel, sorry. Before you before you do that, I just want to make sure that um, the language um i think that we need to update the language that's here because the petitioner had actually provided us with some updated language but i'm just confirming i'm in a shared document right now i don't think that um i think a couple of things have changed so could you just pause for Please. a moment yep, no problem. um and uh i know aaron is is working on the industrial uses actually right now but i want to see if she would mind just coming on briefly to see if we could just uh, identify the sections that need to be updated. Hi. Sorry, we're Hi, tag team here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the petitioners um, submitted updated language. Um, it was appended to the um, agenda, um, which is reflected in um, this version. Um, I can pull it up real quickly. I made that edit after we received it from the petitioners. Um, so for example, um, in, just pulling it up on my other screen, under B requirements, the third, the second bullet under one should say any alteration causing an expansion of or addition 
Yep, that whole section is um, was inserted um, in their final motion. Um, three bullets down, a, parenthes a parenthetical statement was removed and language at the end of the sentence, starting with provided that if such accessory building is located, et cetera, that is new language. Um, in the, yep, all of that. Sorry, it's tiny on my screen because I have a lot of things. I'm sorry, I'm like, eyeballing the screen at the same time. Exactly, all that that Jenny highlighted is new. Um, keep scrolling down that last bullet before two. Um, there was an edit from the state, um, from fire department regulations to state fire code. Yep. So what, um, we, what we saw today, what Jenny sent us is the final version. Now, right? Correct, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Yes, I um, edited it myself. Yeah, review the updates so everybody was on the same page. Yeah, I have, I have no further questions on the updates that were that were added. Any any other board members with questions on the final updates? No. No. Okay. So is there a motion to uh, recommend favorable action for article 43? So moved. Yeah, so moved. Second. Very second. Second. Okay. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So Article 43 moves forward with favorable action. We'll now go to Article 44, which is the zoning bylaw amendment related to parking minimums inserted by James Fleming. This was related to the balance of the zoning districts, which were not addressed uh, during last year's zoning amendment and was um, amended between our last meeting and, um, and uh, this meeting to remove the uh, reference to size of the lot. Jenny, were there any other changes there? I think that was the only change he made. That was it, Great. nothing else. Any discussion, starting with Ken? No, sorry, I just had to finish reading it. No problem. No. Uh, Jean? Um, no discussion, I just wanna say, just for this article and the previous article, I found it really helpful that the proponents of the article came to us sometime before they had to file the article so that we could have some give and take with them. So even though the article went on, underwent a little more changes, we had an understanding of where they wanted to go and where we thought they could go. And I think that worked well for both of these articles. So I thank both of the proponents for that. Thank you, Jean. David? I also wanted to say that I thought the process of bringing these uh, forward was was very effective, and I hope to see it used more frequently in the future. Great, Melissa. Uh, no comment. I support it going forward. Great, thanks. And I um, echo Jean's uh, and David's comments as well. But it was a great process. So, do we have a motion to uh, recommend favorable action for Article Forty Four? So moved. Second. Uh, start with a vote with uh, Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. David. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we vote favorable action for Article 44. The next is Article 45. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment to increase the percentage of affordable housing units. Uh, this is from 15% uh, to a percentage between 25 and 30%. But what, just the, Sorry, the bylaw. Sorry, 25%. It's 25%, yes. Sorry, I Sorry. was reading the top and not the bottom part. Uh, we'll start with discussion. So, uh, Ken. Uh, no, I, I don't think I can support this uh, as written. 
I think without uh, with these uh, requirements, I think you need some sort of a uh, carrot. Okay, uh, Jean. I had some conversations following up on the um, on the public hearing about this with some of the project proponents, and and um, we were all very open to see if we could find um, some compromise that would work, and unfortunately, we couldn't. Um, I know a lot, we've got a lot of um, comments and letters in support of this, but I can't vote for this because of a few reasons. One is, if you read the literature, you don't want to set the number without doing some significant studies to see whether the number will actually work in the specific area, in this case, Arlington, considering lot sizes, demographics, et cetera, or if it will backfire. And we don't have, we don't have those studies to support it. Um, secondly, we did get comments from at least two people who are involved in creating affordable housing, both advising us not to support this because they felt it would actually backfire and maybe result in fewer units um, being done. And I also feel like it wouldn't work without, as Ken said, a carrot, whether it's a density bonus or something else. So I very much support the idea that we need to get more affordable units. And what I'm expecting is that as part of the housing production plan update, and this is in the staff report, that there'll be a look at what can we do with the inclusionary zoning bylaw? Do we combine it with some carrots? Can we increase the percentage? So um, I would vote no action on this, but I expect in maybe a year, we should be coming back with something more comprehensive about what to do about this. Great, thank you, Jean. David? I'll say I, very strongly uh, support the development of affordable housing in Arlington. That said, I agree with everything Jean just said. Um, and um, my, my concern is that if we um, move this forward, knowing that there's a serious risk that it could backfire. Um, and um, and a uh, town meeting goes ahead and, and adopts this and it does in fact backfire, then in order to fix it, we would have to go through uh, a new, um, a new um, bylaw amendment process at a future town meeting that is fraught with all of the difficulties that, that we see um, when we try to make changes like this in which we we saw two years ago when uh, this board unsuccessfully uh, tried to increase the percentage of inclusionary zoning um, uh, together with um, uh, a package of, of incentives uh, to balance that out. And, and that was not, uh, that did not go over well with town meetings. So if we were to move this forward, um, and it backfired, as is likely, uh, it may be very difficult, if not impossible, to change it anytime soon and, and fix it. So I, I think the risk of getting it wrong is, is just too high in this circumstance. Thank you, David. Melissa? Um, no further comments. I feel like what Jean said is pretty accurate in particular support you know affordable housing but want to look at how you can be a little bit more nuanced with this and look at density bonuses and so forth thanks Melissa and I and I think um, I, I too agree with everything that my colleagues have said that um, in, in when when other municipalities have increased their um, required percentages it, it has been a much more nuanced um, you know sometimes a tiered proposal. And that I, I sincerely hope that the proponents of, um, of this article will, will participate um, actively 
in the housing production plan update and the other conversations around affordable housing that we will be holding following town meeting um, in preparation for next year's town meeting. Uh, so is there a uh, motion to recommend no action for Article 45? So motion. Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? No, David? You're on mute. Oh, sorry. Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So Article 45 uh, receives a vote of no action. Next is Article 46, which is the zoning bylaw amendment relative to a teardown moratorium. And we will start with um, Ken. No, I have no questions on this. I'm not supportive of this. I believe uh, this will... Um, um, Hurt homeowners. Gene, uh, I I think the staff got this exactly right, which is similar to what we said at the at the public hearing. Um, this is not an appropriate way to go about determining what to do about the teardown of, of houses, and there are also a lot of learning flaws in the proposed motion that would make it very difficult if any and the town might well get sued if anybody couldn't go ahead David uh, yeah I I agree with those thoughts Melissa um yes I, I agree with those the same same thinking so not to advance this at this point I do as well uh, is there a motion for uh, recommended no action for Article 46? Second. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that is a no action on Article 46. The next is Article 47, which is uh, zoning bylaw amendments for establishing requirements for off street handicap parking. Uh, we'll start with um, Jean. Thank you. Well, um, Jenny and Darcy Devaney, um, who filed this for the Arlington Disability Commission, and um, David and I had a really long and fruitful conversation this morning. And um, um, I think other people can help me if I get this wrong a little bit, but we decided there are other things to explore in how this could be recrafted that we really didn't have time to do between this morning and this evening. And we reached a consensus that the best thing to do would be to vote no action on this and that the um, Redevelopment Board and Disability Commission or its representatives would get together over the next few months and uh, hopefully craft a um, warrant article that accomplishes a lot of what we talked about this morning. David or Jenny, want to add to that? Well, I think we, we uh, would want to um, revise the discussion here in the report slightly to, to reflect uh, that that's the direction that, that we've agreed to go in. Right, exactly. Great, thank you. Uh, Ken, any comments? I'm glad that discussion happened. Um, that's nice to hear. And um, I have no questions, any more than that. Melissa? Um, no further questions. I, mean, I think um, from my experience looking at how we're managing the whole system versus um, setting things on site, especially for smart par parcels like this, um, we have to kind of look at the whole. Great. Uh, David, did you have any, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. If I did, did you have any other comments? Uh, no, no, Jean yeah. captured it. 
Great, thanks. And I um, appreciate all, all of you getting together to discuss that. I, I really do look forward to working with the Disability Commission to um, craft a comprehensive article as you've discussed. So is there a recommendation to uh, for no action for Article 47? Well, do, do we need to just, wordsmith uh, No, I was going to say, just um, please note, no, the discussion part is for the draft report to town meeting, which we're going to discuss in great, greater detail Oh, okay. at, on Thursday night. Um, so I, we, you know, we just wanted to fill in as much as we could because we have to get it done tomorrow morning. Um, so no, we don't, I mean, this was the proposed vote, um, but you're gonna vote no action. That's all you need to do. Okay, thank you. So is there a, a motion to uh, recommend no action? So moved. Second. And we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. All right. The next is Article 48, which is um, uh, zoning bylaw amendment to integrate ADA and MAAB standards into uh, the zoning bylaws, um, also inserted at the request of the select board by request of the Disability Commission. Start with Jean, I believe you were speaking with um, Darcy and Jenny on this one as well. Well, um, we, we um, revised a little bit the main motion and Darcy was comfortable with the revision, as am I, and I think the staff discussion captures, captures this that it's, Fine to add this to the zoning bylaw. This captures that those updates, correct? Yes, it, yeah. yes, okay. it does. Great. Uh, any discussion, uh, David? Uh, no, nothing. Ken? So, Gene, is that the only thing, uh, session D, is what you, only thing that's been added? Uh, to this proposal? Yeah, it's it's a slight rewording of D, Ken. I can't remember exactly what it said before. It accomplishes the same substance, but it was reworded. It had previously, it had references to ADA and um, a, a few, it was um, broader. Okay. I, I have no questions. This is more specific and also notes that they're regulations the MAAB regulations. No, I have no questions. These, these are state laws anyways, that needs to be followed. Melissa? Same, no, no further questions on this. Great. Um, you know, I, I think my comment was, again, I, I think it is um, redundant, but again, I, I don't oppose it. I certainly support the intent um, it's not my preference in policy writing, but I certainly won't oppose it. Um, okay, is there a, a motion to a, uh, to recommend favorable action for uh, Article 48? So moved. Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. I am a yes as well. That moves forward with favorable action. Uh, the next is Article 49, um, which is a zoning bylaw amendment relative to side yard sky exposure planes. And this was um, revised um, a bit from our last meeting. Jenny, um, I don't know if you have, are able to, to highlight, or if anyone has any questions on what the, the updates were specifically for Jenny, perhaps I could start with, with that. I'll start with Ken. I'd, I'd be curious to see what the updates were. There were quite a few questions uh, on there. Uh, um, I Let me open up a different document then, which outlines the updates by the petitioner. Thank you.
Um, this is actually the fun. This is I think this was uploaded um, with all of the documents today um, for the meeting. So I, my understanding is uh, that all of the issues that have been addressed are in red. Um, so I can run through them if you want, or I'm just going to roll through them. How about that? We can stop if you have a question. Yeah. But these are all. I think. I don't think he addressed every issue that the board raised during the hearing um, discussion, but I think he addressed the majority of them. The major one I had, Jenny, was the topo, um, because Arlington has such so many conditions of uh, of non-flat lots, and how do you, how was this how was that addressed? I don't think that was really addressed, um, and I'm gonna. Um, I don't, I'm going to ask Erin if she can also jump on because I don't think he felt he could address that one in the time that he had since the hearing. Oh, he's here. I see him actually, but I don't know if you want to have him speak to this right now or not, Rachel. Um, I, I think we should just go through what, you know, whether we feel that we've had the, the time to review this and that the um, there are a lot of questions about the space in the in the in the edges and the topography that I, I just want to make sure this board feels very comfortable with um, or what you know or propose too that much like we've worked um, with other proponents of articles over a, a, a period of time if this again, being such a nuanced article is something that warrants that type of um, back and forth uh, with, with the board to develop something that, that we all feel really comfortable with. So I'd like to throw that question out to the, to the board and I'll start with you, Ken. I, I just wanna note that um, in these two that are in red here, there's commentary about the grade of the lot as well as differently sh shaped lots. So, I mean, it's, it's getting at the types of issues that were raised by the board. Um, I, I kind of, I'm kind of on the fence of this uh, right now. I mean, I, 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 I agree with the, uh, the intent of this. I'm just not very comfortable understanding all the ramifications of what this might, what might they call or unintentional uh, consequences. And um, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks, but I would love to um, say that we like we would like to uh, take this under advisement and study it some more, then maybe come back to it and we have a better understanding of it. Because it, 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 I agree with it, uh, in, in theory, I just, I just don't know all the consequences that come from it. That's what I have to say. Jean? Well, first, it doesn't have something that I suggested was essential to get my vote. My concern is that if you had um, a new house getting built that was no taller or the top of the house was no higher than the other houses, this, that the sky plane regulations would prevent that from happening. And it didn't make any sense to me that um, somebody could be forced to build a house that was lower in height than the surrounding houses, which would likely happen because of this. I took time walking around town, looking at houses. I looked in some of the R2 neighborhoods and districts, and I think whole blocks, more than whole blocks, whole areas could not have gotten built at all if this had been in place back when those areas were built. I looked in my neighborhood, I live in R1, and I'd say some percentage, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what, but a pretty high percentage of houses wouldn't have been able to be built under the sky plane. So we're talking about something that would not force all those houses to get torn down, of course, but would have a remarkable change in how, in how neighborhoods would continue to look or not look. And I think that this is a blunderbuss when you just need a little surgical switch for a couple of things. The one thing that I was um, 
um, sympathetic to was something that would prevent a new house from shading the solar rays on an existing house. And you can do that without having to put all these sky plane rules in, which it sort of seems to me um, is difficult in a lot of other ways. And you know, when I asked the proponent, you know, what this would solve, one of the things he said, so you don't look out on a blank wall, but you know, you can look out of a lot of houses now and you're looking out on the wall of another house, or you know, you don't get the same wind as if the house next door wasn't there. Well, that's true too. We're living in the 21st century. We're not building up in a rural area. So for all of those reasons, I just cannot support this article. I think it is goes way beyond what needs to be done. Thanks, Jean. David? I, I think the proponent has acknowledged that there are perhaps other ways to approach this problem, um, including um, potentially um, modifying the dimensional requirements um, that already exist. Um, one thing that I felt like I really needed to see uh, to get any kind of a comfort level with this proposal was not only uh, um, visual examples of um, what, what could be built um, if this were put in place, but I also wanted to understand uh, uh, a, a much more thorough analysis of uh, existing structures uh, uh, that could not have been built if this were in place uh, to really understand what the impact of, of this might be um, on, on our neighborhoods. And I just really, it's, uh, I don't have a, uh, uh, I don't feel like I have a good understanding of um, what the actual impacts of this will be. Um, and uh, given that, I, I, um, I don't think I could vote to move this forward uh, as it is currently uh, presented. I would, however, uh, like to see the ARB and the proponent um, uh, have um, um, a more collaborative and ongoing discussion about exactly what problem we're trying to solve and what the options are for, for solving it. Um, uh, whether it is the sky plane approach or changing dimensional requirements or perhaps something else. But um, in any event, um, coming to some sort of agreement on, on where to go with this and what the actual implications of it would be. Thanks, David. Melissa? Hi, I'm here. I am just have to, I had to move around. Um, as much as I like the kind of innovation and trying to be creative about some of the massing, I think um, I'm not feeling ready to move it forward at this time. Thanks, Melissa. And uh, I agree with my, with my colleagues. I, I would very much like to um, work together with the proponent to, as David, I think, said very well, really understand the problem we're trying to solve and to um, create a comprehensive solution where we do understand the, the implications um, and the impacts. So uh, is there a motion to uh, recommend no action for Article 49? So moved. Second. Take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. So Article 49 receives a vote of no action. You, so we you didn't vote, Rachel. I'm sorry, I am a yes as well. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, we will uh, now go back to Article 35. Let's see. So back to the uh, industrial uses article. 
Um, so I think we left off where Jean, you and um, Aaron were starting to speak to uh, potential amendments. So, uh, Rachel, if I'm edited everything. <laughs> yeah, so, if I might, um, this is a shared document on the cloud. So while I was off camera, I made the amendments. Um, so I'm happy to step through them. I believe that they're responsive to Jean's questions and I'm um, welcome to okay. uh, address it further. Great, so Jenny, you. everything that I did is highlighted in yellow um, because uh, the, so um, in this, updates the, this was the comment that I misunderstood from you, Rachel, um, updating the correct language for the upper story building step back. Great, thanks. Um, if you keep scrolling a little bit further, oh, right there. So um, Jean and Kin suggested that additions over the 50%, um, additions over 50% of the footprint of existing buildings shall be solar ready to the extent feasible. I think that addresses that item. Uh, wait, wait, let me look at it for a second. Yep. Um, no, no, I no, didn't, no, 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 I, I think, think it was substantial renovations to existing buildings shall be solar ready to the extent feasible. Correct, Gene. Yep, so these, um, these development standards are triggered when 50%, um, when the addition is 50% or more of the building, um, which is why I use the, the reference of additions over 50% of the footprint. Does it have to be an addition or can it be a renovation over uh, that uh, of 50% of the footprint? Right. The development standards kick in when it's an addition or a new building. But it states right here that all new construction uh, it um, has to be solar ready to the extent feasible. I think that's, I think we should cross that out. It should be solar ready, period. And then only um, renovations to existing uh, buildings. That's what I was trying to get at. I don't know. Um, I was clear enough. I, I was saying that all new buildings should be solar ready. Right, that's there. Period. And then only existing buildings that are uh, that require it to be extent feasible, just not to give it a, too much of a burden. You can worse with that, Gene. You have you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think additions over fifty percent of the footprint is good. But are you saying, Aaron, that we couldn't put in if there's a substantial renovation to an existing building? So if Jenny scrolls up a bit, this section is triggered when it's a new building or a 50% addition. It does not reference renovations. Okay. Okay, that's good. I'm okay that's with that. Fine. Okay, thank you, Erin. Got it. Yep. I mean, I, um, I, okay, can, um, can you see that I made two bullet points? Do you want it that way or do you want it back to the way it was before? Sorry. I have no preference. I'm okay with that. Okay. Great. Um, so if you keep scrolling, um, so Jean, um, you had referenced dark sky requirements um, for this first highlighted here. Title five, article 14 of the town bylaws um, does reference the dark sky requirements. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so I just cleaned up the reference there um, to be title five, article 14. Right. Um, this was uh, Ms. Stamps' suggestion. Um, I think I think it, it is successful um, and responsive to that suggestion. Yep, looks good. Um, oops, so um, this was the, the first highlighted piece in this first bullet is um, where Jeannie might want to tinker with this a little bit further tonight. Um, but that looks, that looks fine, Aaron. Okay, great. Um, Shouldn't it say Arlington Redevelopment Board? Oh, yep. Yes, I apologize. Right. Uh, yep. Yep. So this, uh, the second highlighted piece that's on the screen, um, I think is responsive to um, 
the comment that you could have more requirements than roof space. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so if you keep scrolling a bit more. Uh, oh, uh, oh um, this highlighted under A3, um, I think this was caught as a, it either was the parenthetical with the ARB, right. um, but I just updated that. And then, so this B section, I would recommend just deleting it. Which part would you delete? The, the whole paragraph. How come you'd recommend deleting the whole thing? Right. The, the comment um, from earlier this evening seemed to suggest that it would be uh, limiting in some fashion to have a reference to two artists only, um, except for time limited um, right. engagements. Um, so I, it, it, two, three, five, ten, it, it would be essentially an arbitrary number. Um, then why wouldn't you just keep in work only artist studio and get rid of the second sentence? That's it's stated above though, isn't it, Jean? So these are just, this is the standards. This, there's a definition that still exists for this. For work only artist studio. Correct. Correct. Yes. yes. So in other words, it's and it and it's not listed this way, correct? No. No. Do you want me to go back to what that how this is defined? Is that of no, interest? As long as as long as if we take that out, work only artist studio is still an acceptable use in the industrial district. Okay. It is. It's, okay. They're just not further constrained okay. by saying it can only be. Yeah, then take it out. Or it cannot be more than yep, two yep. artists. Yep, yep. Sounds good. You need to re-letter. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> I'm going to highlight that. And For some reason, it's not yeah. updating. Uh, probably because there's a lot of um, lists in this document that are <laughs> um, manually inputted. Um, so if you keep scrolling down a little bit more, um, we'll get to mixed use. Or, there's in vertical farming, I made that quick update. Um, so uh, in the background, um, Kelly also ran a quick analysis for me um, of the uh, 60, uh, 58 um, distinct parcels. Um, 39 of the parcels are below 10,000 square feet. Um, and if you wanted another reference point, if you did 15,000 square feet, that would encompass 52 parcels. Um, so that would end up encompassing most of the parcels in the industrial district with the exception of some of the largest ones. Some of the largest ones are town owned, of course. Um, so uh, this was my attempt to address your comment, Jean. I also heard that this section might have been con confusing. Um, I don't know why it's duplicated on the screen. That, oh, that. Yeah, it's saying this is locked by you oh, right now. Probably because I. I think this is what we had before, though, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, think, and this, so this is the edited version. I it's think your rewording is fine, Erin. Do you and Kelly both think that 10,000 makes sense in terms of the number above and below? I, I think you're going to get, basically, it's going to be 50% above and below, half and half. Um, uh, again, it's, uh, I think this is uh, an attempt, you know, a good mile marker. I think it could be loosened in the future if it's seeming like this is not working. Seems um, arbitrary to me. Well, you have to set it somewhere. So yeah, it's but we're on the fly but... saying ten thousand like this evening. It feels a little arbitrary to me, Jean. Well, where would we put it, Melissa? We have to have some. That's why I was hoping we could sort of say seventy-five percent would get to do, you know, two to one and 25% would get to do one to one. So the largest one, something like that. 
Well, and what is the risk of not putting that in then? The risk is the risk is some of the largest ones may end up with twice as much residential as industrial. And the reason that this came up was the pro formas that they did said the larger ones could survive and you know and financially would pencil out well at one to one. But Jean, what I heard was that they didn't actually run this on any of the smaller parcels. So right. Right. If that's right. the case, should we, and we feel strongly that residential should not be the principal use in these spaces, should we take this out and instead of a two to one ratio, move forward with a maximum one to one ratio altogether, rather than create an artificial. And, and basically preclude um residential completely in, in the smallest parcels? No, no, it's one-to-one. One. One to one-to-one. One. Well, right, but if it, if, if you can't, I, I don't mean, I don't mean legally precluded, but um, financially precluded based on- They didn't what run we the analysis. Earlier. What, what I heard, and Aaron, please correct me if I'm wrong and I misinterpreted what was said, but there were no performance run for a parcel, for that size parcel. I believe the smallest was significantly larger. I think it said like 19,000. Right. You are correct, Rachel. So we don't have any data to say that it doesn't pencil out without the two to one residential requirement. And we do have, we do have data that it would it would work out for the larger parcels at one to one. That's Can we um, put something in there saying that there's an option uh, if the proponent proves to the, uh, the A or B that uh, one to one doesn't work and they need to get an exception for a two to one on some of the small lots, then, then, then that's okay, but they have to prove to us just for now. Unless it's otherwise approved by a special permit. Something like that, yes. So we keep the 10,000 as a cutoff, but we'd allow, but it would no, be no, if you're too, we, We'd no. remove that. We, we'd uh, remove the 10,000 and just keep it as one-to-one -one unless otherwise approved by special permit. Of, of hardship or whatever. And then it gives us a chance to value that, okay, you know, you have, you have a very small site, it doesn't work. So you need the two-to-one. I think that makes sense if it would be one to one, you know, unless the ARB finds that financial hardship requires up to two to one. Financial hardship or financial infeasibility? Infeasibility. Infeasibility. Good Correct, point. Dave. Sorry. Yep, you're right, David. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it would be one to one, except that the ARB, upon a finding of financial and feasibility made by special permit increases up to two to one. Aaron, are you? I'm going to let you edit. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm like warring over the, the cursor. You go. Does that sound good, Melissa? I I think that sounds a little more reasonable because I mean you're trying to the, you're trying to get the the residential in there as kind of. The incentive to move things yep. along keeps yep. keep the mix of uses right but yep. we're not trying to on the fly without the data set the square footage i feel like this gives us more of a, a balance to that yeah i think you're right melissa i think this is a better way to go about doing it with kin's suggestion of the special permit mm -hmm. for economic financial infeasibility and then you could up it to up to two to one so we could just leave it to Aaron to figure out how to do that after this meeting. <laughs> you got till tomorrow morning, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, I mean, don't we? No, we have to vote on this we tonight. Have to vote on it, right? Yeah. We can vote on it with that change that she's going to insert afterward. Yeah. Do you want to roll through the rest of the highlights? Or was that that would be great. Yep. Well, let's roll through the rest of them. Was, was there any other place in here 
were there need to be an edit to accomplish this this um, change that we're talking about? No, no, that would be the only location. Um, so these last two items, um, uh, I I think in the installing trees within the landscaped areas, it said section 6111D6 of the Town of Arlington Zoning Bylaws. So I got rid of the Town of Arlington Zoning Bylaws. And mm -hmm. the last highlighted section is, um, I just made it less wordy. Correct. Um, and I believe that's it. I think if you keep scrolling, there might've been just some other um, updates. Uh, nope, I guess that's it. Um, Interestingly, um, uh, oh, I did update. Um, so uh, further residential uses may be a component of a mixed use development are limited to no more than the gross floor area of the ground floor, uh, principal ground floor light industrial use. The redevelopment board may allow an increase to no more than twice the gross floor area of the principal ground floor light industrial use up upon a finding of financial infeasibility. Financial infeasibility. Oh, I, I think it has to specifically say may allow an increase in residential use. Right. Correct. It's slow to update on my screen for some reason. Usually I shake it, it works faster. <laughs> Maybe I have too many things open on the screen. There, there it went. While, we're, while we're waiting for that, to, oh, there it is. Yep. So there's this and then the residential floor area. So I just, um, I just want to address also um, uh, a point of confusion that might have um, occurred as we well. We just need to delete this paragraph, by the way. Yeah, I don't know why it's showing there on your screen, Jenny. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's telling me it's locked. Um, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so the, the ground floor of these mixed use buildings can be industrial or commercial, but the allowance for residential is specifically tied to the light industrial use categories. I just want to be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the clarification. I think that's important. Very important. Um, and then the last thing that I didn't address, um, because um, I, you know, I, I would appreciate the input, is the duplicative 592 section. Um, again, I, I feel like the ARB has handled some of that similar um, overlapping sections at town meeting. Um, I, um, my preference is to put it in 5-9, but I'm also, um, I'm not so uh, crazy to say it has to be there. Um, so the other suggestion was to put in 5-6, in Five six four, if I remember correctly. Yes, five six four, which would follow basically the use table, which can be an appropriate location for it as well. If we keep it where you want it, and we have to move it. You have to come back from Maine and work on it. You know, kind of that works, so. <laughs> be happy to do that. <laughs> I'll I'll zoom into town meeting. Um, but I think you know, should it go into five six? Six four, it achieves the same, the same it goal. It just seems a little weird if we go to like favorable action on two um, warrant articles that have the same, you know, addition to a section of the zoning bylaw. But if you switch this, there are about a dozen places where the reference would have to be changed. That's easy. Yeah. I, well, I don't know. I, I think either place would work, but I think, I don't know, to me, I wouldn't have noticed it except when you pointed out, and that's when I thought it would be better at the end of the uses thing. So it could be, what did I say it was? I forgot. 564.
Yeah, five, six, five point six point four. At least you wouldn't, we wouldn't have to deal with it afterward. Oh, they passed two things with the same, you know. Yes, it cuts down on confusion. Yeah. Jean, what's your preference? 5.6.4. Let's go with it. So if we do that, we just uh, just note that we we just need to update all these preferences, right, which uh, we will do, of course. Right. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so I think in sum, that addresses the comments that I heard uh, from the members um, and through the public comment. Great work, Aaron. I don't know how you did that when we're Thank all you. doing all this other stuff. Your magic. <laughs> <laughs> the magic of the cloud. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? Uh, I mean, I, I think the, I think these changes are responsive to the boards and the public's comments. Um, you know, with um, with um, an eye towards making this actually work. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is there a motion to uh, recommend favorable action on Article 35 as amended this evening? So moved. Second. Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that receives uh, favorable, recommended uh, favorable action. And with that, that closes our uh, discussion and voting on the warrant articles. Uh, so Jenny, do you need us to vote to, uh, I think we, since we voted on the individual ones, we don't need to vote any more until we receive on Thursday evening the draft um, to town report, meeting. and then we just need to vote on that, correct? Right, yep, and we're going to post that by tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay. Okay, uh, so the next item on our agenda uh, is the review of meeting minutes. Hopefully we can get through these quickly. We'll start with uh, the meeting minutes from February 8th, uh, 2021. And uh, I had a couple of items. So um, on page one, I think it was near the bottom. Um, it's in that second to last. So it's five, uh, five uh, lines up from the second to last paragraph. Um, I'd like to see, it should be, I'd like to see, um, this map, not if this map, if you go down, down, there you go. I think if you need to get rid of, whoops. Above, two lines up. Sorry, for some reason, my computer is being very extraordinarily okay. slow at the moment. So, so it's um, the section that says, so um, I'd like to see you if tell me. So um, it's the, the sentence that says, I'd like to see if this map, if it should just be, I'd like to see this map reflect it. Um, the if doesn't make sense there. And then which, on, which one are we looking at now? Uh, February 8th. Okay. And then uh, on page- I'm making the edits. I just, um, it's not on the screen. That's fine. Um, on page two, the section um, in the middle of the page, the, the sentence with Carl Wagner said, the sentence doesn't make sense. Uh, Carl Wagner said he thinks that this is a laudable goal at the same time, the people who live in East Arlington 
because that area, um, something's missing. And I, and I don't know what, Jean, I don't know if you saw that. I, I didn't, I couldn't figure it out either. I think maybe it's, um, this is a laudable goal. And at the same time, maybe if you just removed the people who I, live in yeah, East Yeah, I think it's just because that area is that area already. Is already. Yes, so I think you could just remove the people who live in East Arlington. And then um, in the next section, um, Chris Loretti uh, section, Uh, it's the last sentence, the chair said she would like to clarify that this report was um, requested to be, um, to be prepared by the department. It was requested by the board to be prepared by the department. It's, it's not clear what it's referring to. And then um, on page three, Uh, I'm going to have to search to find that reference. That's all I have for right now. Jean? Oh, I had a couple of things, but I was scrolling on yours and I lost them. One thing is I think Stuart Borson's name is spelled incorrectly. I think it's B-O-R-S-O-N, but somebody might want to check on that. Um, I don't know what this means, but um, in on page two, it says, Ms. Loretti said he's concerned about the lack of setbacks and 40 foot walls. What's the 40 foot walls part? Walls, I think it was. And 40 foot walls? Why do, I don't understand the he lack of- He thought that there would be walls. just a wall at, at the side of a property that's 40 foot straight because of not having a setback. I remember him saying ah, that. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. And there was one other thing, but I can't find it now, but it was really important. So the only other one, sorry, I found the one that I was looking for. It's on page three in the middle of the page, um, the, set, the paragraph with the chair. Um, in the third sentence, Mr. or the third line, Mr. Benson asked it should be if there are handicapped accessible entrances instead of is. Uh, David, any corrections? Uh, no, I don't have anything. Ken? Nope, not on this one. Melissa? No. Nope. Any others? Jean? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the February uh, 8th, 2021 um, meeting minutes as amended? So moved. Second. Uh, and Melissa, I don't believe you were at this meeting, so I will skip over you during the voting. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Okay, the next uh, meeting minutes are the March 1st, 2021 meeting minutes. And I'll start with uh, Jean, any corrections? I just, you know, this is the one where they don't have you starting off by saying, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, right, we'll just add that line in. Yeah, so I think whatever it is needed to be it. And I don't think I found anything else other than that. David? I didn't have anything. Ken? Yeah, uh, on the... On the first page, I think like third paragraph down, Mr. Lau was concerned about the close to zero lot line. And I should say the exhaust ducts from the garage was close to the, uh, to the, close to the lot line, period. And then the second one is, is he also suggested the top level could be less heavy 
uh, I, I want to say he suggested moving the stairs and elevators away from the uh, from the lot line to a. Um, I guess I used the word heavy, but make it less um, less massive. Thank you, Jenny. Got it. Uh, and then uh, this one, um, I think I got in a little trouble with, as misunderstood. On the third, second page, near the bottom, um, Uh, Ms. Lassie, the, the town needs to balance develop, uh, development. Um, housing should include market rate, workforce, and affordable, ho affordable housing. I think you had uh, stated it better, Rachel, last time when you uh, wrote that response. The variety of needs. Yeah. Anything Is, else, Ken? What you want to say, Dave? Oh, sorry. I was just thinking about that and thinking whether saying mid-market housing might be an alternative to workforce. But that's true. But I didn't say that. <laughs> So uh, I, I right, usually, but I think that's what you that I, that's, that's what, what I you, meant. That's what you meant. Yes, <laughs> you're absolutely true, David. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure Jenny's gonna edit it, and I'm fine. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who have I not gotten to? Uh, David, any? No, I had nothing on this one. Okay. Melissa? No. Okay. So I just had um, one uh, on page four. Uh, near the bottom, I think it's one, two, three, four paragraphs up from the bo bottom where it starts. Mr. Benson requested the condition of the basement office be constructed and, and rented. Um, after that, Mr. Anessi clarified that the basement office exists. Right, he did say that. He did. Sorry, can you repeat that sentence? Uh, uh, so after the sentence with Mr. Benson requested the condition that the basement office unit be constructed and rented, after that period, uh, Mr. Anessi confirmed that the basement office already exists. Got it. Great. And then on page five, somewhere here, there is a reference to fiber Uh, right in the middle in the par uh, paragraph with Mr. Revelak, instead of fiber paddle boards, it should be fiber panel boards. Brick construct. Yeah, there you go. That's it. I do have one one more thing, and uh, I'm not sure how to. Uh, on the same one on the page number three, I guess, or four, uh, it says. Mr. Lau requested, uh, Mrs. Uh, um, we'll ask Jenny to clarify the locations of the elevator shafts and stairwells. And you say that they are. They yeah, obviously that. I, I think the clarif I think you were asking me to clarify something else. Yes. I don't know what. Not the location, um, but if they counted towards a formula. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that this is stated correctly. I, I think I asked a question. That I know. I remember now. I think I asked a question that is only the ground floor for elevator shafts and uh, stairwell shafts count for GLA, or is it count on every single floor? And then you said that um, 
uh, it's already uh, existing. Uh, they, you count on every single floor someone of that. Isn't that correct, Jenny? Yes. Um, so I would just say, um, not already, yeah, okay. I think I'm gonna say counted. That's fine. I think that was more more to the point. Um, Rachel, my power is gonna go out. I have to go get the cord, but it's, it's hard to get to right now. Okay, we're almost, uh, that's fine. Let's let's take a quick vote, unless there's any other comments. Nope. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to uh, approve the uh, meeting minutes from March 1st, 2021 as amended? So motion. Second. I'll take a vote. Melissa? Yes. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. All right, so we will now move to uh, open forum. Uh, so any member of the uh, public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function, um, which is in the participant section in Zoom. Um, I'll call on you and you'll have three minutes to speak. Give it a minute. Uh, Christian Klein, you'll have three minutes. If you could introduce yourselves by first, last name, and address, please. Sure. Uh, Christian Klein, um, of 64 Newport Street. Um, I've served the town in a variety of uh, different positions, uh, most recently on the Zoning Bylaw Working Group um, alongside Aaron Zverka, who is leaving us at the end of the weekend. We don't have a meeting um, this week of our group, so I just wanted to take a brief minute to just thank her very much for her service to the town and her service to our group. And it was a tremendous pleasure uh, working with you these past few years. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, members of the public? Barbara Thornton. Yes, well, uh, I want to duplicate what Kristen just said. Uh, ditto. Uh, Aaron, working with Aaron and Jenny both were just a, a tremendous uh, experience, and I want to thank the entire board. But I think we really, I feel like we moved. I learned a lot in this process, and I and I appreciate the comments that everybody made about the working process on the ADUs, and I and I hope that we all learned how to navigate a, a more collaborative process between the citizens and the, and the board and uh, the staff. And um, Aaron, you'll be missed. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Uh, the next speaker will be James Fleming. Hi, James Fleming, Fifty Eight Oxford Street. Uh, Thanks for helping me with the warrant article. Uh, it was really, really useful. And uh, you should expect uh, more like that in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to it, James. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak? All right, with that, we will uh, close public comments. And I'll thank Erin so much for all of the the hard work that she's uh, given to the town over her uh, time here. We've loved working together with you. You'll be so missed. I'm sure that others have, Jean and David and Ken and Melissa probably have things they want to say to you as well. There's still one more meeting <laughs> that I <laughs> would attend. Um, but thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Um, all the kind words from everyone that I've received in voicemails and emails and on Zoom meetings. It, um, it, it's really wonderful to hear. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah, you've been a real asset to the town and I uh, hope you enjoy and do great work somewhere up there in the pine tree state. Thank you, Aaron. And your grasp of the details of every zoning proposal at, the, at your fingertips has been truly impressive. 
Thank you. All right. Well, we won't keep you any longer because we know that uh, <laughs> there's the report that you'll be feverishly working on too. So thank you in advance for that. And uh, with that, we will uh, take a motion to adjourn. So motion. Second. Uh, Ken? Aye. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.